Sup, my fellas, don't forget to leave feedback and enjoy the story. The protagonist, Martinak, and we see him running away from his assailants. An arrow hit his leg, sending him sprawling to the floor. An elderly man who was pursuing Manak brandished a sword and gave the order for his men to search Manak. The old man raised his sword, beheaded Marnak, and let blood fly as the other two men discovered a relic on him and gave it to him. Angrily, the severed hand of the goddess that Marnak served, the mother of corruption, came crawling towards Marnak. The severed head of Marnak spoke, telling the mother not to be angry and assuring her that corruption did not exist. Manak clarified that one had to pass away there. While the mother of corruption became more and more enraged over the relic's disappearance, Martinak's body stood up. She was reassured by Marnak's severed head that he would have already gathered the relic if she had been concerned about its divinity. Picking up his severed head, Marnak put it back on his body. That's exactly why, he said, there was no need for a pointless story to follow him. He did, however, wind up losing some cash in the process. Let's go back to the time before he lost himself in the virtual world. With his hectic and demanding schedule, Martinak had little time for gaming in his late 20 seconds. Consequently, he frequently turned to hiring an editor in order to make concessions to reality. Even the name of the game and the reason he had bought it escaped Martinak's memory. However, he persisted in his role-playing, motivated by his desire to become the corrupt priest. In case you're wondering what the priest of corruption is, it's the hardest class to advance in, the hardest to play, and it's thought to have subpar performance. Even with these difficulties, every time Marnak played this game, his heart skipped a beat in anticipation. Approximately when Marnak finished all of his class quests and used up all of his resources for class advancement, he was able to earn the title of Priest of Corruption. But then something strange occurred, he became engrossed in the game and felt drawn into its virtual universe. When Marnak first swore allegiance to the Mother of Corruption five years ago, it all began. He only had two things when he woke up in the game, the Mother of Corruption's hand resting on his chest and a robe from the Order of Corruption. These were his only belongings in this strange virtual world. Having quickly come to terms with the fact that he had indeed fallen into the game, Marnak felt a strong connection to the hand of the Mother of Corruption. The Priest of Corruption was a genetically enhanced human who had undergone drug-induced modifications, according to the game description. With the help of this knowledge, Marnak was able to comprehend the essence of his character in the game. Consequently, Marnak was endowed with increased physical prowess, sharper senses, and a body that could only be destroyed by a supernatural force. He'd never been able to handle blood, so perhaps there was something neurologically wrong with him, but even seeing a graphic scene didn't bother him. The only problem was that there was nothing left in his body to taste or feel. After obtaining his ID at the Mercenary Guild Hall, Marnak went up to the young woman with the red hair, Aaron, and asked her about any open assignments. After asking Martinek to hold on for a moment, Aaron started looking through the files on her desk. She told him after a moment that they might have some work for a priest of the goddess of preservation such as himself. Upon arriving in the northern city of Giz, Marnak chose to adopt the persona of an Order of Preservation member. He had to stay in his own order, he would have suffered dire consequences if he had tried to pass for someone from another order and aroused his god's wrath. Only members of the order that Marnak impersonated would have been able to see a special mark, called the Thief's Seal of Punishment. Strangely enough, the Mother of Corruption, whom he served, was kind to these impersonations. It was significant that Marnak, who was hated by all, was the only person who continued to support the Mother of Corruption, while the Order of Corruption stood as the enemy of everyone else. Aaron grinned as she joyfully informed Marnak that she had found a job that was exactly suited to his skills. As she turned the assignment over to him, she said how happy she was to be working with him. After reading the paper, Marnak discovered that the job involves either monster or bandit hunting. He also discovered that farmers making their way to Gooey's are gradually becoming less visible as of late. The Lord of Gooey's is rewarding anyone who can identify and eliminate the reason behind these disappearances with 30 nips of silver per person. In the event that they fail to win the cause, each person will still get one silver nip. Aaron informed Manak that the majority of other hired guns would ask her to proofread everything. With a smile, Marnak stated that it wasn't a particularly special skill, but he was thinking that since the moment he entered this world, he had been able to read and write in its language. To Aaron's surprise, Marnak requested a favor, asking if he could have a portion of the reward immediately. After Marnak and the other mercenaries left, he heard a voice calling out to him from behind. It was Pierre, a yellow-haired man with dazzling eyes. Pierre asked Marnak if he would mind sharing his place of origin since he was positive that Marnak was not from Gouis. Martin warned Pierre that his village would soon be visible if they kept walking down the road. Pierre said he hoped everything was going well for his parents. He said he was sure his parents would make it through the winter because Captain Gallad had given them a sizable donation to help them out. Pierre, though, couldn't help but wonder why he continued to worry about them. The more Pierre grumbled, the more Marnak became irritated. It occurred to Marnak that Pierre also spoke a great deal. 
All of a sudden, the captain called Pierre. Pierre informed Manak that he would return shortly and that it appeared he needed to go ahead. The corrupt mother gave Marnak the order to murder everyone. Why did she keep telling him to kill everyone? Marnak questioned. He told her that it would become a problem for him if they all passed away. When he got back to Gui's, Marduk claimed that the mother of corruption had never said anything. He explained that he wanted to spend this winter in warmth and that he was in dire need of 29 silver nips at the moment. Marnak said that he had acted a bit too forcefully. He comforted the severed hand, telling it not to be so depressed. How would Marnak plunder everyone? Marnak asked the severed hand. Every mercenary saw hands that were invisible to everyone else but Martinek. Upon witnessing the unseen hands, Martin thought to himself that it appeared as though there was no particular someone. He thought about how he could get divinity depending on how many fingers they raided if he killed them and sent them to the mother of corruption. He would receive 10 divinity with one finger, 100 divinity with two fingers, 1000 divinity with three fingers, 10,000 divinity with four fingers, and 100,000 divinity with five fingers. Additionally, Marnak can obtain one authority if he is able to gather 10,000 divinity. Manak gains authority and is able to absorb the divinity of a holy relic because of the system. The captain is telling Pierre something, but Marnak believes there are now just 12 relics. The mother of corruption promises that all of Martinak's desires will come true if he can gather the divinity of each relic. Martinak believes that he will first request to be able to taste again. Pierre came up to Marnak and said the captain had told him not to worry about Marnak too much. Pierre said the captain had told him that from dawn on, if Pierre kept talking to Martinak in that manner, Martinak would get very irritated. But Manak told Pierre that he was okay and that he shouldn't worry too much about him. Abruptly, an arrow struck the other mercenaries, causing them to fall one after the other. Two more arrows were aimed at them, but Marnak moved quickly to grab Pierre and shove him away, taking two of the arrows to strike Marnak. Marnak reasoned that since he was on the ground, they had to be bandits. Manak believed that the mother of corruption wanted him to pretend to be dead so he could gather their divinity whenever he had the opportunity. That seemed like the most straightforward course of action for him to take. After asking her if she knew, Marnak got to his feet and noticed a sword being swung against the ground. He took it up and stated that he usually does things like this. Marnak hurried to get close to the bandit who had struck him. He hit the bandit, letting the other bandits in the forest know that he was there. The bandit captain gave his men orders to leave the priest in his care and to come assist him once they had taken care of the other people. Marnak felt an intruder coming. When the bandit captain tried to sneak up on Marnak, Marnak was able to deflect the attack. In an attempt to establish some distance, the bandit captain spoke with Marnak. Speaking to the severed hand, Marnak asked what rank the bandit captain would receive from it. The bandit captain retaliated by attacking Manak and demanding to know what he was saying. The bandit captain's attacks are all blocked by Marnak. His mother gives him a two and a half finger gesture. That a simple bandit is on the same level as the ranger who cut his throat astounds him. As Marnak considers how unfair the game is, a smile appears on his face. The bandit captain then strikes again, severing Marnak's sword in half. With a mocking chuckle, the bandit captain taunts Marnak about the potency of his weapon made of frost steel. Looking at the size of his broken sword, Marnak realizes he lost because their weapons were not the same. The bandit captain tells Marnak, grinning, that he will spare his life because there doesn't seem to be anything special about him. He continues by saying that they were already going to leave the area and that they had already planned for this to be their last mission. With a smile, the bandit captain offers to Marnak that they both give up and head out. Dropping his broken sword, Marnak accepts the offer and tells the bandit captain to immediately leave the area and give up his life as a bandit. Martinak tells the captain that he will show him mercy if he obeys, all the while keeping a smile on his face. With a sigh, the bandit captain wonders if Marnak is serious, doubting that they would just nod and walk away. Just as Marnak is about to reply, an arrow suddenly hits him in the head. The bandit captain, who believes that Marnak is going to kill him, looks over his shoulder and tells his men that they arrived late. One of his friends chastises him, saying they saw him sever the priest's sword in half. In response, the bandit captain answers haughtily, saying he had calculated the exact angle at which to swing his sword to make the cut. The bandit captain turns to face his men, who brashly reply that they have made sure to kill every last one of them when he asks if they have really killed everyone else. But Marduk, in a menacing tone, cuts them off and asks if they really killed everyone. The bandits are left dumbfounded, unsure of how to react to Marnak's question. Pulling the arrow stuck in his head, Marnak got to his feet. Then he looked around at the shocked bandits and asked them what had startled them so much. He declared that it was truly uncommon to see someone able to withstand being shot in the head by an arrow, shattering the arrow, asking if this was the first time they had seen something like that. As the others stood there, perplexed, the bandit captain conjectured as to what Manak might be considering. He was about to launch a spell when Marnak started to emit green energy, reminding everyone that he had given them a chance to think twice before, but they had answered by aiming an arrow right at his head. 
the bandit captain gave the order for his men to shoot Marnak with arrows, and they did as he said. Still, Marnak did not falter in the face of the arrows, staying motionless. He started to pray while the arrows were piercing his body. While the others wondered if Marnak was some sort of monstrous creature, one of the red-haired bandits cried out that there was no way Marnak could withstand such an attack. Seeing that his men had to retreat, the bandit captain gave the order to do so. But when they tried to pull back, they found an invisible wall blocking their way. The pair was ensnared. Marnak wondered whether the line through which the living are barred was a power reserved for the priest of corruption to activate after observing their predicament. It was used to hide the divine power of corruption and to keep alive enemies from escaping. Desperate to get help, the bandits cried out for someone to come to their aid. Grinning, Marnak conveyed how much he valued the power he had now been granted. When the bandit captain realized how bad things were, he accepted that there was nothing else they could do. He gave the order for his men to draw swords in anticipation of a fierce battle. But before the captain could say anything more, a terrifying beast attacked him, making his subordinates fearful for his safety. The other bandits looked at the hideous creature, fear visible on their perspiring faces. Their fear was increased when the monster let out a loud roar. Overtaken by terror, the bandits begged for their lives and pledged to give up their life of banditry permanently to Marnak. They pleaded with Marnak to save them, but all Marnak could do in return was smile. He gave the monster orders, allowing it to destroy everything but their heads. The mother of corruption gave Marnak the order to gather the bandits' severed heads and gather their divinity. But Martinak voiced a worry, saying that the bodies would disappear if he removed the divinity from them. He issued a warning, saying that the guild members who would show up to look into the matter would become suspicious of such a disappearance and might suspect foul play. When Marnak looked more closely, he saw that Pierre was still breathing and that he was lying on the ground. In an attempt to put an end to the matter, Marnak promised to take care of Pierre's injuries and told the mother of corruption, enabling her to achieve serenity. Marnak pledged to use every effort to save Pierre, realizing that doing so would be advantageous for both Pierre's health and Marnak's standing in society. He asked the mother of corruption for help in stopping Pierre's injuries from getting worse. In a secret location, the high priest, holding a goblet, asked the person who had taken the relic what had become of the thief. In response, the male priest said he had heard that the thief had been immediately beheaded. The chief priest was curious as to the whereabouts and final resting place of the thief. In response, the male priest clarified that they had been unable to retrieve the thief's body because of a shortage of supplies. The chief priest allowed the male priest to return after acknowledging the situation and taking into account the facts. He then announced that she was going to make a pilgrimage from that moment on. The male priest was taken aback by the chief priest's abrupt announcement that they would be going on a pilgrimage and asked why. He wondered if it had anything to do with the prophecy they had been given. His suspicions were confirmed by the chief priest, who declared that the pilgrimage was, in fact, a response to the prophecy. She also mentioned that she needed to meet with a certain person. A prophecy that all religious orders were given ten years ago stated that the world will end and that death will resemble the husk of life. Aaron gave Marnak a call to let him know he could now go back. She clarified that the guards had granted her the required authorization. Aaron, looking surprised, said that she had never expected Marnak to be so strong, given his appearance. Feeling a little uncomfortable, Marnak conceded that he might be stronger than he seemed. Aaron said that she had heard that the heads that Marnak was holding were the source of all of their problems as she took notice of them. Her suggestion was that their guild should keep them for the time being, rather than having Marnak carry them around. Marnak gave the heads to Aaron after accepting her suggestion. Aaron asked Martinak whether he had a place to stay, as if she was worried about his accommodations. In response, Martinak said he thought the city would have a room available for him. He stated that he planned to begin his search for one shortly. Aaron, however, voiced additional worries, pointing out that Manak was homeless. Then she made the offer for him to stay at her house. Clearly taken aback by Aaron's suggestion, Martinak blushed in response to her invitation. The following morning, Manak informed her that he had already known and understood, which is why he had agreed. He claimed not to be planning anything nefarious with the girl with the lovely red hair. Aaron only intended to say that she would let Marnak sleep in the guest room of the mercenary guild. Unexpectedly, a knock on the door caught Marnak's attention. Aaron greeted Marnak and said that although she would rather let him rest for as long as possible, Marnak needs to take care of something. After getting up, Marnak told Aaron not to worry and put on his slippers. When Marnak questioned Aaron about what appeared to be the problem, Aaron replied that Tradon Philion, the Lord of Gooeys, was interested in seeing him. The news that the Lord desired to see Marnak took him by surprise. Aaron was asked by Marnak if she knew why the Lord was asked for him. According to Aaron, the deceased mercenary Captain Galad was actually the Lord's half-brother. When Marnak arrived at the Lord's mansion, the butler took him to see the Lord. Tradon asked Marnak if he had witnessed his brother's last moments before telling his butler to leave, 
which the butler complied with. When Tradon asked if Marnak would like some tea, he simply grinned mischievously. Mother of Corruption drew an X when she first saw the Lord, and Manak questioned Tradon about his life while living in disguise as a human. There's only one explanation for why the Mother of Corruption drew a big X on the Lord the moment she saw him, even though she was hiding inside Martinek's pocket. Due to the fact that Tradon was not a living being, only demons are capable of taking on the form of a human. Even though they are more powerful than all other beings, demons are helpless creatures, and they are forced to negotiate with the creatures of that world in order to integrate into it. The gods despise the demons who gave as much as they took, which is why demons love all living things. The gods ultimately made a declaration to all living things and their followers. These entities will henceforth be referred to as demons, and because of their evil nature, the priest's search for demons began at that point. Upon reflection, Martin realized that Demon Contractor was a challenging course that many purposefully avoided. Since he played the Demon Contractor class as his second class, Marnak was able to recall. Astonished, Tradon remarked that he was able to be in the company of a notable guest because of the dead gallant. Tridon does not believe that Marnak is actually a priest of the Goddess of Preservation because Marnak is able to see through Tridon's disguise. Don gave his true name to Marnak and said he could call him Crawling Weight. In the same way, Marnak identified himself as a priest ministering to the Mother of Corruption and permitted him to use the name Marnak. When Tradon heard it, he was taken aback. He assumed that the Mother of Corruption was distraught, and he never imagined that there would be a Son of Corruption still alive. When Marnak obeyed Tradon's instruction to take a seat, Tradon informed him that he hadn't called for a specific reason. Tradon asked Marnak to explain to him how exactly Galad died. When Tradon promised to compensate Marnak for his efforts, Marnak grinned and replied, Okay. Manak left the mansion and is staring at it after speaking with Tradon. After complaining that Galad had no work this winter, the Lord attempted to give Galad some work under the table, which he considered to be a very unfortunate event. Nobody would have predicted that Galard would pass away as a result, he believed that life was a challenging endeavor. After checking the gold in the pouch he was holding, Marnak informed the mother of corrupt practices that Tridon had not used the gold to entice him, Rather, Tridon's intention was to discover the truth. Martinak informed his mother that he is not a gold-loving priest and that she had gone too far in that regard. Martinak enraged the mother by asking if she knew that gold doesn't rot. Manak is attempting to soothe her, pleading with her to hear him out until the very end before losing her cool. It's crucial to pay attention to everything he says until the very end. He tells her that there is something, which leaves mother perplexed, that doesn't rot and endures as long as gold. Mother of Corruption was informed by Marnak that she is the object of his love and will always be his top priority. He assured her that she didn't have to worry in such a way because of this. Irene asked Marnak, who seemed happy to be back, why he hadn't greeted the priests of the teaching sect. With a smile, Martinak thought to himself, I don't want to talk to those cult freaks right now. The Mother of Corruption informed Marnak that one of them had a holy relic as soon as they saw them, alerting him. The man said to Martin, dedication to a life of right, adding that he never would have imagined seeing a priest of preservation there. The man introduced himself as Orvis and declared that he was the big one, Cornu, and finally, Patna, the weight on the scale of vengeance. Greeting them, Marnak bowed his head and said, My name is Marnak, and I am a priest serving the god of preservation. Irene informed Marnak that the education sect priests were also staying there, just like Marnak. Marnak was relieved to hear Irene's words because he reasoned that he would still have plenty of opportunities to steal their relic even if it wasn't now. The only problem is that some corruption-related divinity will inevitably seep out when Marnak absorbs the divinity from relics. He wondered if he would have to steal again. Orvis informed Manak that they would like to go greet the Lord briefly and that they could have a longer discussion when they next met. Marnak questions why the priests of the education sect would greet the Lord as they prepare to depart. Irene informed Manak that for a nominal fee, their guild typically offers sanctuary to priests such as themselves. Irene questioned Martin if she would really make him pay for yesterday, to which he replied, why would she? When Irene questioned Martin if he believed she didn't let him stay because she was interested in him, Martin answered that he didn't. Irene teases Manak by claiming that she did have some personal goals to assist him. Leaning against him, Irene whispered to him that she was wondering if Marnak could bestow a blessing of preservation on the food to keep it from going bad. Irene's words continued to frighten Marnak, who wondered why she was whispering such things in his ear. Irene grinned and jokingly replied, I wonder why she would do such a thing, taking pleasure in Marnak's response. At that moment, Cornu came back and noticed that it appeared the two of them were getting along pretty well. When Marnak questioned Cornu about why he didn't travel with Orvis, Cornu explained that he was forced to make the decision because of the unfavorable views that many northern lords had of him and his people. Cornu admitted that all he had done was express his respect. Irene, though, stated that she thought such gestures were not very important to Lord Tradon. 
She went on to say that although Tradon could come across as aloof to others, he was an extremely competent worker. Iren continued by telling them that Tradon distinguished clearly between his personal and professional lives. She went on to say that many members of the guild supported Tradon, so she urged them to keep their mouths shut when they spoke negatively about him. Cornu acknowledged this and promised to bear it in mind moving forward. Out of curiosity, Cornu asked Iren if she could tell them anything more about Lord Tradon. Iren concurred and went on to provide more information about Tradon, illuminating his personality and achievements. Suddenly, Marnak interrupted and inquired of Cornu the reason behind their initial decision to visit Lord Tradon. Cornu candidly revealed that they were presently carrying out prophecies that they had been given ten years prior. The expression the end of the world hiding in the husk of life, according to Priest Orvis, alludes to some kind of demonic entity. As he asked Cornu if they thought Lord Tradon was a demon, Marnak's expression grew more concerned. Cornu promptly reassured Manak that they had no intention of designating Tradon as a demon. Rather, Priest Orvis only wished to use his sacred artifact to independently confirm whether or not Tradon had demonic characteristics. Something unexpected happened in Trident's office. A bright glow emanated from Orvis's holy relic, signaling the presence of a demon. Orvis and Patina were surprised by the unexpected event. Suddenly, there was an explosion, warning Cornu and Manak of the impending danger. Tradon changed, taking on a demonic appearance, wreaking havoc, and demolishing the nearby structures. The Orvis hammer released a tremendous burst of energy and shone brightly. It hit with such force that it destroyed the surroundings and attacked the demonic version of Tradon. The air thick with smoke and dust obscured the view. Cornu saw the priest, Orvis, pointing the massive hammer of punishment at him from a distance. Intrigued, Cornu told Marnak about the fierce fight involving Orvis, Patina, and the terrifying demon. When Cornu saw that their friends were in trouble, he pushed Marnak to join the battle and help. But Marnak had other ideas, and he made the decision to head back to the mercenary guild hall, promising Cornu that he would soon catch up. Arin answered Marnak's call, asking about the current state of affairs. Marnak quickly lifted Arin in response and asked where the hospital was that Pierre was being treated in. He was hoping to locate the medical facility as soon as possible, so he asked Arin to lead him to its exact location. Carrying Arin, Marnak left the guild hall behind. Arin heard the people around them calling out for help desperately as they made their way. People were scrambling to escape for their lives as the evil presence of Tradon materialized in the center of the city, causing chaos. The residents courageously made an attempt to flee in spite of the dangerous circumstances, putting forth every effort to find safety. Orin informed Marnak that the monster was located in the city's center, but Marnak urged her to disregard the monster and asked her to find Pierre. Pointing in a particular direction, Orin informed Martin that Pierre was nearby. They went into the room where Pierre was passed out. While Marnak grinned at the sight of Pierre, Orin felt relieved that nothing had happened to him. In a catastrophe such as this, Marnak had to save Pierre's life, and he could not let him die. Marnak grabbed Pierre and told Arin to cling on tightly because he would no longer be able to hold her in both hands. Arin, feeling a little awkward about it, obeyed and gripped Martinak tightly. After that, Marnak pushed his way out, and Arin told him about a hidden passageway she was aware of. When Marnak asked where it was, Arin pointed to a particular house and said that it had a hidden door that led to the edge of Gui's. She did, however, mention that the passage door was locked. Without any hesitation, Marnak kicked open the door. Arin was shocked by Martinak's strength demonstration and declared that he was actually very strong. Manak put her down gently and told her to use the passageway to get out if things got worse. Worried about Marnak's security, Arin inquired as to his plans. In response, Marnak said he had to go back, and he headed back to where Cornu was. But when he got there, Marnak was astounded to see Cornu lying there. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. Janak looked into Cornu's condition right away. Breathing heavily, Cornu managed a response when he realized that Marnak was present. Silently acknowledging that there was nothing more he could do, Marnak felt helpless and that Cornu's wounds were too severe. Fearing that leaving Cornu in his current state would cause his death, Manak asked the other priests who had accompanied them where they were. With a feeble reply, Cornu disclosed that Patina had passed away. Concerned and determined, Marnak asked Cornu if there was any chance of beating the demon. Hunching over, Cornu told Marnak that the white sword that Priest Orvis had managed to drive into the demon's head was the key to the solution. Cornu clarified that the demon ought to be vanquished if Marnak could grasp that sword and successfully drive it into the demon's brain. Sadly, Cornu died, and Martinak bent over his lifeless corpse. After starting to gather the divinity emancipating from Cornu's corpse, Marnak achieved 100 divinity by this Sommer procedure. Meanwhile, Orvis persisted in his unrelenting combat with the demon, unleashing a potent attack with his ability to wield the Hammer of Punishment. The demon, though, showed tenacity and made an effort to remove the Orvis from its back. Taking advantage of the situation, Martinak saw a gap and jumped onto the demon's back, ready to attack. Even though everything was ideal when he landed on the demon's back, he still needed the white sword to carry out his plan. 
Suddenly, Marnak noticed a strange movement coming from the demon. Marnak sensed the imminent threat the demon was about to unleash its devastating death roll ability with a menacing swing of its body. Manak braced himself as the violent movement of the demon made him lose his balance and fall off its back, signaling the impending threat. When the mother of corruption asked how Marnak was doing, he replied that he was fine. As she thought back on her previous remarks about blessings coming after calamities, Marnak couldn't help but smile. His eyes landed on the relic resting next to him, and he thought to himself that this had been an interesting turn of events. Manak took the relic in his hands and held it out to the mother of corruption, presenting it to her. He asked her to set her seal aside and give him new power, his voice full of resolve. The relic is grabbed by the mother of corruption, and green energy bursts from it. Every holy relic, according to Mardak, contains enough divinity for one authority. The relic has been broken, allowing the divinity of corruption to seep out significantly. It's surprising that Marnak can get 11,723 divinity out of this one relic. Now that another seal had been broken, Marnak lay contentedly on the ground. He went to the mother of corruption and asked her to tell him what this development meant. The mother of corruption told Marnak what was going on, and he asked her if she was telling the truth. Marnak was appreciative that even though she was far away, she could still support him but he doubted that breaking the seal on a sacred artifact could be regarded as unimportant. The mother of corruption grew irate, but Martinek promptly explained that he was just ecstatic to be seeing her develop. Manek stopped gesticulating at the mother of corruption after realizing how serious their current situation was. Rather, he started chanting and proffered her 10,000 divinities as a token of his devotion. A bright flash of green light appeared in response. Manek cried out to her, begging the mother of corruption to give him power. Marnak's request was granted when he bestowed the 10,000 divinity upon the mother of corruption, and a new power known as the text of corruption was bestowed upon him. Marnak feels his whole body covered in dark green metaphysical tattoos that appear when he activates this authority. His physical abilities can be amplified and enhanced by these markings, giving him newfound strength and prowess. Mother of Corruption was confused when Manak told her that the authority wasn't all that bad. He said that in that case, it would be fairly helpful. He got to his feet and brushed the dust from his clothes, noting that his crushed leg had also at last healed. When Marnak noticed the lifeless body of Priest Orvis smashed on the floor, he thought it appeared as though they had fallen off simultaneously. He started chanting, drawing divinity from the dead Orvis because he felt that the bird should be allowed to rest in peace. The demon was roaring in the middle of the city, wrecking havoc and obliterating everything in its path. Observing something strange, Marnak said that the priests of the teaching sect were the ones who had incited the demon's wrath. For reasons that were still unclear, the demon went on the rampage even after all of the priests had died. From the dead body of Orvis, Marnak gained 1,000 divinity. He thought about how demons were more than just animals motivated only by instinct. Manak observed something strange and developed a strategy based on his findings. Using his newfound power, Martinak told the mother of corruption to cling close to him and warned her that there would be trembling. With a goal to reach the top of the demon's head, Martinak rushed towards it and skillfully avoided its attempts to shake him off. It was from this position that he saw the white sword. But Martinak noticed that the demon appeared to be getting ready to roll again as it leaned its body. Surprisingly, Marnak had predicted precisely this. He deftly touched down at the precise moment the demon rolled again, but Marnak easily sidestepped the blow because he had anticipated the move. He was confident that the same move wouldn't be successful on him again because of his foresight. Flames burst forth as the demon rolled, enveloping the area and turning houses into ashes. When Marnak coughed up blood, he saw that the unintended consequence of his newfound power was developing more quickly than he had anticipated. An unsettling thought occurred to Marnak as the demon started moving again. He remembered that his body had begun to rot inside when he used the text of corruption. If the demon persisted in its stalling, the corruption would eventually spread elsewhere, making it impossible for Marnak to carry out his mission. Because time was of the essence, Marnak quickly scaled the top of the demon's head after realizing how serious the situation was. Taking up the white sword with firm grip, he thought back to what priest Cornu had said. Cornu said that the demon would die if Marnak was able to successfully stab it in the head, right in the middle of its brain. Calling on Lord Tradon to wake, Marnak withdrew the white sword. A moment later, a dazzling blue light burst forth, sending the demon's enormous form crumbling to dust. As the dazzling bursts of light dispersed throughout the city, the enthralled locals took in the sight. The flashing light faded and the silhouette of Lord Tradon emerged, his legs and arms severed and lying on the ground. With caution, Marnak walked up to him and asked if he was awake now. With a calm smile on his face, Lord Tradon said that meeting Marnak had been the best thing that had ever happened to him. But, Marnak assured Lord Tradon that appreciation was unnecessary. He continued by explaining that Tradon's consciousness had been suppressed by the White Sword, which is how the situation had come to be. Reaching out, Marnak inquired of Lord Tradon how he felt about the help he had given. 
Lord Tradon's face lit up with a smile as he extended his hand to take Martinax, telling him it was definitely worth it. A priest from the Torch sect uses her power somewhere on the mountain, and a blue flame shoots out of her hand. She makes use of her skills to look for signs of Marnak's purportedly deceased body. The elderly man beside her was astounded by the blue flame and believed it to possess such amazing power every time he saw it. But he was dissatisfied when he couldn't locate Martinak's lifeless body anywhere. He was positive he had slashed Martinak's throat at that precise moment. He reasoned that a good amount of time had passed and that Martinak's corpse might have been taken by monsters or wild beasts. The priest of the torch sect admitted that she could make it there, and she expressed her gratitude to the elderly man for guiding her the entire way. But she had one more request she would like to make. She asked if the elderly man could tell her the names of all the cities that were close by. Meanwhile, the demon's rampage's aftermath remained visible in the center of the city. Lord Tradden's butler went to Marnak's house and brought him to the Lord's office. Lord Tradden was happy to see Marnak and greeted him warmly. He said he had been looking forward to Martinak's arrival. Lord Tradden gave Marnak a compliment, stating that he appeared to be getting more attractive every time he saw him. Manak responded by thanking Lord Tradden for the encouraging remarks and praises. Tradden said that he couldn't adequately thank Marnak and called him a demon slaughterer. Dan mentioned that demons like him also deserve to live when Martinak respectfully retorted that Tradden was still alive and breathing at that precise moment. He thought that no life was created with the intention of dying. Acknowledging Triden's sentiment, Manek said he was not incorrect. After everything was resolved yesterday, Triden informed the town that Marnak had heroically vanquished the enormous demon that had made an appearance. In the process, he also revealed that Martinak had saved him. When the villagers heard of Martinak's valiant actions, they were overcome with admiration and thankfulness for his bravery and altruism. After Triden made his announcement, Marnak was given the grandiose moniker Demon Slaughter, which he thought might not be entirely appropriate for him but it appeared that Aaron liked the nickname especially, for whatever reason. Even in public, she would not stop calling him Demon Slaughter, a fact that always attracted the attention of those around them. Because of Aaron's insistence on referring to him as the Demon Slaughter, Martinak's notoriety spread quickly throughout the community. His newfound notoriety was further enhanced by the rumors that circulated, according to which he had defeated seven bandits by himself. The villagers were stunned by these stories, especially in light of Marnak's modest appearance. Currently, Marnak couldn't help but observe how effortlessly Triton's wooden prosthetic limbs moved. Seeing the interest in Marnak's gaze, Triton clarified that he had only shown this ability to him. He disclosed that he feigned a limp to hide the full functionality of his prosthetics when he was among other people. Triton mentioned that he had to pay a high price in exchange for being able to move around in such a natural way. Marnak inquired as to the nature of the price that Triton was discussing. The hairs on his body would eventually weaken and begin to fall off like leaves in the middle of autumn, Triton retorted, grinning. Triton assured Marnak that he was certain Marnak would see his bald head if they crossed paths in a few months. As soon as he heard this, Marnak couldn't help but picture the scene. Then Triton asked Manak if he happened to have a week or so to spare. Manak retorted that he had plenty of time on his hands. After declaring that everything was ideal, Triton shocked him by revealing that he had received a job offer that specifically requested that he hire Marnak. Having heard tales of the infamous demon slaughter, Triton told Marnak that the requester thought he would be ideal for the position. The work at hand appeared to have something to do with the sacred artifacts of the former empire, and for that reason they looked to Marnak's experience for the position. It was pretty alluring when Triton said that the payment for this work would be five whole nips of gold, which would be given beforehand. But what really grabbed Marnak's attention was Triton's statement that they would be happy to give him one of the relics they found if the requester thought he was a big help in their efforts to explore the ruins. The mother of corruption suggested that Marnak look at the ruins, and he accepted her advice, thinking it would be best to see the ruins directly. As he gladly accepted the offer, memories of the past began to flood his thoughts. He remembered stories from long ago. An ancient empire once ruled this continent, ending the period of unhappy sorcerers and restoring unity to the whole. The holy relics from that ancient empire have gained value as priceless treasures in the modern era due to technological advancements and evolution. These artifacts are known to possess remarkable and powerful powers. Put another way, the majority of objects that are valued highly in that realm are actually remnants of the former empire. After speaking with Triton, Marnak left right away to visit his purported friends who were exploring the remains of the old empire. He identified himself as Marnak, a priest of the preservation goddess. The individual in the center identified herself as Carmen Voltus, the person who had applied for this position. When Marnak heard Voltus's name, he recognized it. Carmen affirmed that Marnak was right in his conclusions. He disclosed that Anthony Voltus of the Black Wolves is his father. Carmen expeditiously clarified that he is Anthony's child by a previous marriage. Marnak gave a smile in return. 
However, he found it hard to accept that Anthony, a morally upright member of the Black Wolf Pack, was the father of an illegitimate child. He imagined that after losing his wife, Anthony would be by himself. Mayak conceded that the truth and hearsay surrounding an individual may differ, but he concluded that it would not be appropriate to go any further into this subject. After that, Marnak asked Carmen if she would mind introducing the individuals behind him. Carmen responded, of course, to this change in topic. Carmen started introducing the mage with the tunisa, or robe, covering her head. He clarified that they would be led to the historical artifacts by Tunisa. Next, Carmen presented Sukis, a Unihorn tribe member. Using his moniker Demon Slaughter, Sukis greeted Marnak cordially, calling him a dependable and sturdy man. They shook hands. Experiencing embarrassment over the nickname, Marnak asked Sukis to refer to him as just Marnak. Sukis reassured Marnak that rather than being ashamed of his achievements, he should be proud of them. After the introductions, Carmen recommended that they leave since it would take them two days to get to the location on foot. Two days later, while the other two were sleeping in the middle of the night, Marnak and Carmen remained awake. When Carmen questioned Marnak about his plans to stay up late, he replied that it would be best if he could get some rest. He assured Carmen that he wasn't tired because he had gotten enough sleep. Before the sun rose, there was still plenty of time, and Carmen started to get the urge to hear some captivating tales. He inquired as to Martinak's fair share of female relationships, but Martinak retorted that he was similar to recently fallen snow that had blanketed a field. Carmen was surprised by this response. Carmen then inquired as to whether Martink preferred any specific type. With a smile on his face, Marnak mentioned how much he enjoyed having women by his side. However, Carmen stated that he thought a woman's heart was the most significant factor. This sentiment was approved by the mother of corruption. Carmen then admitted to Martinak that he was a curvaceous woman. Having a clear idea of what Carmen desired was not a bad thing, according to Marnak, who also thought it would be very helpful for his journey. But, Martinak offered some guidance to Carmen, advising him to avoid discussing his preferences with women. Carmen reassured Marnak that he didn't engage in such conversations with other people. Carmen said to Martinak that he always felt like he was speaking with an old friend during their conversations, and Martinak concurred. At last, Marnak and his friends reached their destination early the following morning. One of the group members, Tunisa, produced a key and proclaimed that she would now open the ruin's entrance. As they got ready to explore the mysterious and ancient site, there was a lot of excitement and anticipation in the air. It was not difficult for them to enter the ruins of the ancient empire. They needed to locate the key first. They then made their way to the coordinates indicated by the key. They then turned it by inserting the key clockwise or counterclockwise after reading the passage written in an ancient language on it. But on such explorations, mages play an indispensable role, since only they are able to read the ancient language written on the key. Players would be the lone exception to that rule. While playing, Marnak has the ability to read the old language, but he doesn't reveal it. He has no connection to the key in this world at all. Luckily, obtaining the key turns out to be too challenging for him. Manak and the others unlocked the ruins entrance and entered. They discovered an incredibly remarkable well-preserved ancient site there. Carmen said that this was one of the best preserved ruins out of all the ones he had seen. He was sure there would be a ton of artifacts to find, so he suggested with enthusiasm that they get to exploring. Unable to believe he now had the opportunity to see the ruins he had only seen in pictures, Marnak couldn't help but grin. He said it felt like the excitement was going to explode in his heart. Tunisa felt a tinge of resentment towards Manak and couldn't resist watching his response. When they were investigating the ruins, they came across a massive door that had an old book written on it. Show that imperial blood flows through your body, it said. The text's color changed to red as Tunisa read the old book, and the door opened. She went on to say that they should get ready for battle if they didn't have ancient imperial blood. Monsters rushed at them as soon as they entered the enormous room. Sukas killed dozens of monsters with a single blow after swinging his battle axe quickly. However, Tunisa utilized her potent spell to cause the earth to burst, completely eliminating a number of monsters in the process. They both battled valiantly, protecting themselves from the creature's constant onslaught. Unsheathing his sword, Marnak cut loose a deadly blow at the approaching monsters. One creature did, though, try to ambush him from behind. Thank goodness, the mother of corruption warned him about the threat in time. Quickly defending himself from the unexpected assault, Marnak realized that he had to kill this specific monster in order to protect them. The monster had already been struck in the head before Marnak could finish thinking. Carmen had acted quickly to protect Marnak from the impending danger by striking the monster first. Mayak expressed his gratitude to Carmen for her prompt assistance during the fierce battle. 
When Marnak and Carmen heard Sukas yelling at Tunisa, their focus was taken elsewhere. Sukas questioned Tunisa about why she continued to push the enemy between their lines, voicing worry that she might have injured Marnak or him in the process. In response, Tunisa said that the quickest way to eliminate the adversaries was to push them between their lines, emphasizing that they were still able to kill every monster. Sukas was clearly incensed by her response, and he gritted his teeth to try to contain his annoyance. Carmen, on the other hand, moved in swiftly to defuse the tension by telling them to stop fighting. Sukas attempted to calm himself by inhaling deeply. Carmen expressed her admiration for Manek by telling him that he truly lived up to his moniker as the Demon Slayer. After chuckling a little, Marnak told Carmen that he felt embarrassed to be such an unholy sight for a priest. Carmen acknowledged that Martinek was correct in that regard. Manek shifted the conversation, telling Carmen how amazing he was with the bow. Carmen retorted that he had used a bow and arrow ever since he was a small child. He went on to say that he had given it as much practice as possible. When the two walked away, Tunisa asked them when they were going. She claimed that since she still had a lot of mana left, she was okay with leaving right away. Sukas was still upset at this point, so he questioned Tunisa about why she was always rushing to move on even though they had hardly had any sleep. He clarified that rest was necessary for people like himself and Martinek who needed to move around physically. Tunisa said she thought everyone would concur with her. She maintained that it would be preferable if they arrived at the end of the ruins as soon as possible rather than wasting time there because everyone, with the exception of Sukas, was okay. Sukas was even angrier when Tunisa accused him of attempting to cause a scene. Carmen responded by stepping in and telling everyone to get some rest before continuing on their journey. He announced with firmness that they were done talking. Although Tunisa disagreed, she followed Carmen's request to take a nap. At that point, Tunisa turned to leave as Marnak left. In this world, mages were usually viewed as a bunch of jackasses and were thought to be stuck up. Being a mage in this world is a relatively simple process that occurs at birth. Mana is innate to those who are born as mages and becomes active at a specific age. After they awaken, they learn about the old language, which fills their minds and gives them magical powers. And they learn old spells without having to pay any additional fees. They are reborn as mages, using the mana that can break the laws of this world. But they have an inbuilt dislike of learning new things because of all the information that occupies their heads. Consequently, the majority of mages turn into stubborn, illiterate fools. The majority of them are inconsiderate of others around them and are self-centered. Like the other mages he has encountered, Marnak is the same. However, Tunisa is actually regarded as one of the more civilized mages, to be honest. They made the decision to proceed to the next location after getting enough sleep. Then the room they were in began to tremble, and then the doors closed, confining them inside. When Marnak and the others turned to face behind them, they witnessed a white metal giant emerge from the red portal. The enemies they had faced up to this point were too weak for a ruin like this, so Marnak knew it couldn't be true. The white metal giant had to be the real deal, Martinak surmised. With a confident gesture, Tunisa asked Sukas to step aside before beginning her spell. The rocks began to float, the ground gave way, and Tunisa's staff began to glow. Carmen yelled at Tunisa, warning her that it's dangerous, after noticing something strange about the white metal giant. He gave her the order to cast the spell and move aside. To the amazement of the three, Tunisa launched an attack, but the white metal giant managed to avoid it. As Tunisa saw the approaching attack from the white metal giant, she was disturbed and helpless. The enormous figure smashed Tunisa to the ground, so terrified that Sukas could not move. Sukas was yelled at by Marnak to get down, but it was too late now. Sukas was struck by the white metal giant, causing his body to fly through the air and collide with the wall. As he questioned Carmen about his desire to live, Manak had a troubled expression on his face. In response, Carmen stammered as he admitted to Marnak that he did want to live. Then, after suggesting that Carmen tuck his chin in, Martink gave him an uppercut. Sensing the benefit of having a giant on his side, Marnak addressed the mother of corruption, demanding that she send his giant down right now. He made it clear that he didn't have time for prayers because he was rushing. Manak's corruption giant violently destroyed the white metal giant during the intense battle launching an unrelenting attack on its powerful foe. Using the confusion to his advantage, Martinak quickly slung Carmen over his shoulder and made a calculated retreat, knowing that he could always rely on his corrupt giant for strength and dependability. After absorbing the divinity from Tunis's staff, Martinak experienced a notable 1000 divinity boost. Additionally, he used Sukas's battle axe to channel 100 divinity. Manak took great care to position Carmen so that she would be safe while the two giants engaged in combat. He concluded that it would be best to keep Carmen out of harm's way until the altercation subsided because he anticipated that it would take some time for the confrontation to end. The mother of corruption told Marnak to quit playing around, and Marnak chose to heed her advice and start lending a hand. Then Marnak charged at the two giants. He made the decision to go after the white metal behemoth, concentrating on the blue gem that was lodged in its head. 
The giant of corruption that Marnak had called forth reached out its hand, and Marnak jumped to meet it, scaling its enormous limb. As he was climbing, it occurred to him that something would undoubtedly happen if he succeeded in destroying it because it was the only area of the white metal giant's body that had a distinct appearance. Trying to smash the blue gem, Marnak leaped off the top of the giant's head. He was successful in breaking the blue gem into pieces with a single, powerful blow. The white metal giant ceased to exist as a result of smashing the blue gem, and the corruption giant that Marnak had called forth roared triumphantly. Mayak thanked his summon for the priceless assistance it had given him. When the mother of corruption gestured, Marnak questioned her about the issue. He was shocked and alarmed to discover that there were more white metal giants when numerous space portals opened. Manak had a troubled look on his face because he was surprised that there were more of them to handle. There was a huge task ahead of him as he wondered how many more of these giants there were. In the following few hours, Marnak waited for Carmen to come to. Upon Carmen's awakening, Manak tenderly informed him of the demise of Tsukas and Tunisa. He apologized profusely and told Carmen that although he had wanted to save them if given the chance, things had happened too quickly for him to get involved. Carmen expressed his sorrow over the passing of Tunisa and Tsukas, and it was clear how sad he was. He clarified that they were meant to activate the key at that crucial moment when the metal giant fell from the ceiling. He disclosed that he had only recently met Tsukas and Tunisa, two new hires, and that his loss was deeply felt. He held himself responsible, believing that his own avarice and tardiness had led to their demise. In order to ease Carmen's concerns, Marnak reassured her that Tsukas and Tunisa had been hired for a reason and were fully aware of the risks associated with their line of work. He emphasized to Carmen that they had voluntarily chosen to assume these roles, which included dealing with risky situations. Carmen inquired as to Martinek's location at the moment, to which Martinek replied that he was outside the black door. He was about to ask Marnek a question because Carmen was taken aback, but he refrained. Carmen came to the conclusion that it wouldn't be appropriate to inquire about something that Martin was prepared to kill him for. Ultimately, Marnak saved his life, and he didn't want to undermine their friendship and trust by investigating something Marnak obviously wanted to keep private. Carmen promised that he would make sure to pay back his debt to Marnak in the name of Valtis. With a smile, Marnak replied that he would be anticipating it. Karen was informed by Martin that he believed it would be best if they moved as soon as he felt better. Carmen nodded and concurred. Then, Marnak acknowledged that he had fled from the metal giants rather than vanquish them. With the assistance of the corruption giant, he was able to defeat a single metal giant, just as Marnak had predicted. His problems didn't stop there, though, as three more metal giants dropped from the ceiling. Instead of confronting them directly, he allowed the corruption giant to bear the brunt of their blows. Martinak took a chance after he just about got the doors open. The reason he kicked the unconscious Carmen into the room was probably to keep him safe from outside threats. Nanak was sure the giant of corruption, who he had told to return as soon as he was done, would return soon. Announced that they had arrived at the edge of the ruins, Marnak stopped moving. He turned to face Carmen and proposed that he explore this last area to see what might be there. When the last door opens, Marnak and Carmen discover two antiquated artifacts, a necklace and a sword that resembles a chainsaw. Carmen was shocked to learn that the tales in the books were true. Even though he knew he had no right to ask Martinak for a favor, he persisted in asking. He asked to have the necklace, claiming he would pay Marnak well for it. Marnak inquired about the meaning of the necklace from Carmen while laughing uncomfortably. The necklace is known as the Bloodline Pathfinder, Carmen retorted. He clarified that the necklace would use the wearer's blood as a cost and direct them toward the intended bloodline if they spilled some blood onto it and focused on a particular bloodline they wished to find. Upon hearing the word bloodline, Marnak grinned, feeling as though he now had a rough notion. He disclosed that he was currently looking for his mother, whom he had never met before, because Carmen was positive that Marnak already knew about his scheme. Manak asked Carmen, in a courteous manner, if he could have the sword. Carmen said that, for the time being, he would prefer it if he could avoid any blocks of metal larger than himself as the two set up camp outside. The metal giants would have reached Manak and his companion sooner if they had postponed even a moment. Carmen asked the priest, Mardak, if he could bless his pendant, and Mardak answered in the affirmative. Then, Carmen injects a tiny bit of blood into the historic relic of the necklace, and crimson energy emerges. Upon examining the pendant, he feels relieved to learn that his mother is still alive. The necklace is functioning as expected, which makes Marnak happy as well. Carmen was appreciative of Martinak and pondered how he could pay him back. Manak assured him that he would be prepared to accept it gratefully at any time. Carmen asked Marnak to do him one last favor, to which Marnak replied that it would be perfectly okay. Carmen stated that if he could continue working with Manak until he finds his mother, that would be ideal. Carmen told Martinak they could go to the capital together since he was going to be going west anyhow, and he wants to give him something in return for his help. Carmen made it clear that he would cover every cost associated with the trip. 
though he would love to accept Carmen's offer, Marnet kept to himself because he was afraid she would quickly figure out what he was up to and he didn't want her to think he was shallow. Then, Marnak takes Carmen's hand and promises to support her on her journey if she's okay with him helping her find her mother. The following morning, at the mercenary guild hall, Iren is furious that Martin is leaving without any further explanation. After all that she has done for him, she finds it hard to believe that he would leave. Iren handed it to him and said, normally, it takes longer to come out. She assured Marnak that she had done everything within her power to have it ready on time. When Marnak sees the silver mercenary plate that Iren gave him, he is taken aback. Then, Eren reminded Manak that she was certain he knew exactly what he was meant to say to her. When Marnak thanked her, Eren became irate and told him to say something like see you soon, which sounded like a promise to come see her again. Although Marnak felt bad for Eren, he chose not to give her the promise because he believed that since he is a vagabond, he might not be able to keep it. Eren sighed and warned Manak that he would die alone and never get a date if he continued living his life this way. Then, confusing Marnak, Eren made the decision to say that they would see each other soon if they had the chance. When Marnak saw Lord Tradon at his current residence, she was taken aback by how quickly the side effects started to manifest. Lord Tradon remarked, Besides, don't all people lack hair from birth? I have just arrived at a more authentic version of human nature. Then he informed Marnak that he had heard he was going to the capital and that, upon learning of the news, he had taken care to prepare. In order to show his appreciation, Lord Tradon sent a recommendation letter to Manak. He said that although he would have loved to give Marnak his money back in cash, he was currently out of money because he had spent it all on GUIs and repairs. Tradon wrote him a letter of recommendation for this reason. He went on to say that he was certain that Marnak could get assistance from a friend in the event of an emergency. However, Tradon advised Marnak not to visit them unless it was absolutely necessary because they can be difficult to deal with. When Marnak thanked Lord Tradon for the recommendation letter, Tradon advised him to consider it a gift from a friend. Tradon expressed his wish for Marnak to have a fulfilling life and noted that life is never long enough. They had been gone from Guiz for a few days already. Carmen said that it appeared as though they would only have a few hours to spare before arriving in the next town, Kelton. Marnak grinned, realizing that the mother of corruption still wasn't all that fond of Carmen. But the fact that Carmen was a human being with a three and a half finger rating was the only reason she agreed to Marnak traveling with her. He believed that if he could harvest from Carmen, he would be able to bestow upon himself 10,000 divinity, which was equivalent to an authority and the capacity to grow into a person deserving of four fingers. For his part, Martinek preferred Carmen's upbeat disposition and would prefer to see him survive. Marnek pulled out his sword as soon as he noticed a strange smell. Feeling uneasy, Carmen asked Marnek what was wrong. Marnak said he smelled blood, which confused Carmen. Manak stood up and declared that it was approaching them and that it was getting closer. Abruptly the ground began to tremble and then burst. From the earth came a gigantic spider known as a snow spider. Carmen was ready to hit the snow spider with her arrow. However, Marnak charged at it, severing a portion of its body. The next time he used his sword, Marnak promised to find a place to clean it up beforehand, his energy level soaring. With a menacing grin, Marnak persisted in his assault on the snow spider, complaining that it was splattering too much flesh and blood. His fierceness and excitement for combat were clear to see as he battled with tenacity. Meanwhile, the priest of the Torch sect pays him a visit at the temporary office of Lord Tradon in Giz. Lord Tradon expresses regret that they must have to have this conversation in the office given the destruction of their greeting room. Tradon was going to tell her how he was feeling, but she insisted he not worry about her. Tradon then asked her directly why she was there, mentioning that such a pilgrimage was unusual for the blue flame of the torch sect. The woman asked him to look at a piece of paper she was holding. Tradon looked over the document, and she asked if he'd ever seen a man like that. When Tradon realized it was a sketch of Marnak, he was taken aback. He pretended not to know who the man in the sketch was, sweat streaming down his face. Tradon asked the woman, quite nicely, who the man was that the torch sect's blue flame was searching for. In response, the woman stated that it was due to private matters. Is that correct? Tradon asked with a nod. He expressed his regret to the woman and said that no one really came to mind. At that point, Tradon advised her to go back if that was all she needed because he didn't have any more time to spare in situations like this. The woman nodded and said, of course. Tradon couldn't get rid of the feeling that the woman wasn't looking for Marnak with the best of intentions after she left the house. But he made the decision not to tell Marnak about the encounter, since he thought that without knowing, Marnak would be alright. Returning to Martinak's spot, he became curious when he saw Carmen interacting with the lifeless snow spider. Carmen responded that he was taking the snow spider's venom sack out when Marnak asked what he was doing. Karen explained to Marnak that the anesthetic effects of the venom sack were very strong and helpful in a variety of circumstances. Carmen stated that using it on arrow tips increased their market value and allowed them to sell for a high price already. The idea that Carmen, a youthful master, would be informed about such matters made Marnak laugh. 
he questioned Carmen about how he learned about the Venom Sec. Harmon retorted that he had learned about it from real-world experiences and had taken part in multiple monster hunts. He underlined that practical experience is the best way to learn. Carmen split the venom sack in two, releasing a flurry of blood. Marnak, who was already covered in blood, expressed surprise at the volume of blood that splattered out and offered to take care of the situation. He instructed Carmen to just point him in the direction of the venom sack, he would handle the extraction. Carmen told Marnak that they would be reaching Kelton in just 38 hours. He proposed instructing Marnak on how to remove the venom sack so that they could do it jointly. The guards at the city gates were shocked to see two unannounced travelers approaching in the afternoon of that day. Evidently shocked to see Martin and Carmen, one of the guards ran over to them. With a stutter, he inquired about their means of transportation since they didn't seem to be there at all. Manak and Carmen appeared confused and unable to comprehend the circumstances. In response, Marnak told the guard that they had just strolled the entire distance to Kelton. The guard went on to explain that nobody had been able to enter or exit the city for the previous three days because of monster attacks, which had blocked off Kettleton. As he asked the guard for more information, Marnak's expression became serious. The guard went on to explain that monster attacks had been happening more often of late. What baffled them, though, was that when they combed the attack sites, they discovered neither any corpses nor any evidence of the monsters. The citizens of the city and the guards were extremely worried and on high alert due to the confusing situation. Carmen asked the guard if he was talking about the victims of the snow spider attacks. He thought it strange since snow spiders were supposed to be blood-sucking monsters, so it was quite strange that they left no trace of their existence. As the approaching guard called out to them, Marnak and Carmen turned to face him. The guard told them that Lord Strawn wanted to see them and was requesting their presence. They followed the guard to the meeting with the city's lord, unsure of what the lord might want from them, in the hopes of learning more about the recent unexplained events and the increasing monster attacks in Kelton. Leading the way, the guard led Martinak and Carmen to the estate of Lord Stantron. As soon as he arrived, Lord Stanton gave Marnak a hearty welcome and expressed gratitude for coming. Manak admitted that he was already aware of the alarming monster predicament in the city. This was confirmed by Lord Strawn, who also said that the recent monster attacks were the real reason he had called for them. A Sama revelation was revealed by Lord Strawn, who clarified that the current state of affairs was not solely the product of sporadic monster attacks. Rather, it was being directed by an individual who worshipped an evil spirit. While listening intently, Marnak voiced his doubts, pointing out that sealing off a whole city seemed like a major task for a lone devotee of a malevolent spirit. The disturbing information that the priests had given Lord Strawn was that at least four different sects were working together to keep Kettleton cut off from other cities. Marnak was shocked to learn of this information and realized how intricately coordinated the current state of affairs was. Lord Strawn sobbed and said he was positive his father would have come up with a plan to get them out of that predicament if he were still living. According to Lord Stantron, they weren't all that bad because they had enough supplies to last them and the troops' morale was high. But he also pointed out that nobody knew that Kelton was isolated from the others when they were abruptly cut off from them. He clarified that this was the reason they required a brave individual to face the monsters and inform other cities. Lord Stantron went on to say that in order to complete this risky mission, they needed a suicide corps. Upon learning this, Marnak assured him he would do everything in his power to assist. When Marnak accepted the assignment, the Seekers of Flow gave him the item. He had never thought he would be able to find the item in Kelton since it was only found in the western desert regions. Mother of Corruption was reassured by Manek that he wouldn't have to worry about tidying up after using Slayer. He mentioned that she had been the one to suggest that he insert it that way because it would make a cleaner cut. The object floated away as Marnak put it in his virtual storage. He really chose to accept the Lord's offer because he thought it might be a sign that the main quest would soon begin. The cooperation of four distinct sects was the factor that led Marnak to reach this conclusion. Although the term evil spirit sounds menacing, it meant very little in this particular game. It was only a title by the principal gods upon certain other gods, which resulted in a stigma against them and persecution that followed. However, it is uncommon to find a mentally sane person among those who worship the evil spirits. Association with such malevolent entities frequently results in erratic conduct and disturbed minds. Marnak observed that the sects that serve evil spirits seldom cooperate, in contrast to the sects that serve the main god, who cooperate to combat evil spirits. He began to suspect that something odd or noteworthy might be going on based on this observation. Marnak couldn't help but believe that the cooperation of evil spirit sects and their choice to encircle the city was out of the ordinary as he and the others rode their horses to complete the task. Carmen glanced over her shoulder and saw snow spiders scuttling up out of the earth, a startling sight. He was startled by these creatures' unexpected appearance and instantly became extremely vigilant. Manek grinned resolutely in spite of the perilous circumstances, thinking the moment had come to take on the challenge. 
He gave Carmen assurances that he would handle attracting the snow spider's attention. Carmen voiced concern, expressing surprise at his bravery and saying that even for Marnak, handling them all would be too risky. Manak made a sincere attempt to persuade Carmen by stating that if they kept going in the same direction, they would be discovered. He stressed that Carmen had to be well aware that they wouldn't be able to outrun the snow spiders at their current speed. He thought that acting now would give them the best opportunity to neutralize the threat and make a safe retreat. Carmen was shocked to see Martinek release the leash, but Martinek told him to gather more support in a composed manner. Manek asked Carmen if he didn't think his line just now was cool as he laughed and fell to the ground. Carmen was forced to part ways with Martinek for the time being, his face displaying a deep sense of guilt. Just as he turned to leave, more monsters materialized and moved quickly toward Martinek, who was still on the ground. The shadow of Marnek rose, and he smiled proudly, taking the mother of corruption's criticism of his acting as a mild compliment. Resolve, he made the decision to take advantage of this chance and begin looking for the worshippers of evil spirits who were hiding in the shadows. Manak charged the monsters with unwavering determination, using his attacks with merciless efficiency. He killed every creature that came in his path while fighting without showing any mercy. Upon the final monster's fall, Marnak discovered that he was covered in their blood, a sign of the intense fight he had just engaged in. He persisted in his pursuit of the worshippers of evil spirits in spite of the gory scene. In the middle of the adrenaline rush, Marnak joked, laughing, that he might have to start carrying a bathtub around with him to clean up after such fierce battles happened every day. Wearing a determined look, Marnak entered the cave, knowing full well that the devotees of evil spirits must have detected his approach. In spite of this, he saw that they had no intention of approaching him to say hello. As Marnak explores the cave, she discovers blood-smeared boxes scattered throughout. The guard had mentioned, he thought, that the attacked carriages were empty. The reason for this must be that the monster brought all of them to the cave and looted them. Saw a dead body sucked dry by a snow spider, Marnak. He turned to look around and noticed cocoons hanging in bunches overhead. He assured the corrupt mother that he would not let his guard down. Manak is curious as to how many people the monster was able to consume. They cannot finish in three days due to the sheer number of bodies. He wants to know if they have any children. Manak observed that the tunnels were rather large up until this point as though more than one giant shared the space. He also became aware of the divinity that follows him everywhere. Knowing full well that the monster exists, Marnak gave the order for it to emerge. The omnivorous spider descended from the sky, encircled by a swarm of other spiders. There is a loud explosion that echoes throughout the area as the human-eating spider touches down. With a sly smile, Marnak requests that the mother of corruption determine where the corruption line is. The small fry is unable to intervene as a green energy begins to surround them. Priest Marnak says he will be offering the head of the human-eating spider as a sacrifice to the mother of corruption tonight as he begins to pray. The corruption giant attacked the human-eating spider quickly to deflect its attention as it abruptly emerged from above. A glowing tattoo appeared on Martinak's face as he instantly activated the text of corruption, realizing how urgent the situation was. Marnak realized that the spider was defeating the corruption giant as he watched the fierce struggle between the spider queen and the corruption giant. The Spider Queen was clearly twice as big as the Corruption Giant, demonstrating the size disparity. Manek killed the smaller spiders nearby with quick, accurate strikes. He kept evaluating the situation and felt that the Spider Queen's body held the center of the energy source. Aware of how crucial it was to protect it, he made every effort to avoid hurting the Spider Queen during the conflict. With increasing assurance, Marduk thought there had to be a vulnerability on the Spider Queen. He had an idea as he was killing another spider. He came to the conclusion that the key might lie in the divinity coursing through the spider's body. Acting upon this realization, Manak planned to amputate the spider's legs in the hopes of weakening it and revealing its weak point. Manak gave the corruption giant orders as he bounded toward the spider queen. He gave the giant a straight line to run in order to make the spider queen stop moving. The corruption giant complied, using his enormous strength to hold the spider queen's legs firmly and render her immobile. This gave Marnak more time to concentrate on his strategy of chopping off the spider's legs in an attempt to severely weaken it. Determined by his newfound understanding, Martinak realized that despite the spider queen's enormous size, it was still a spider with weak points. He chose to launch his attack on the area of its body that was the thinnest. He struck quickly and accurately, repeatedly hitting the spider queen's weak point before launching an unrelenting attack. The battle reached a climax with the unwavering attack of Marnak and the corruption giant's attempt to hold the spider queen's legs. With a last, strong blow, Marnak's unrelenting assault proved successful as he sliced the spider queen in half. The massive beast collapsed to the earth, vanquished, as Martinak's resolute plan of action succeeded. Feeling distressed by the ire of the corruption Goliath, Marnak professed his regret for fleeing earlier. Upon hearing the curse, Marnak went up to the person and boldly declared that he was certain it was a human. Crawling out of the monstrous form, 
the person yelled at Manic, asking him to identify the person who had ruined his plans. Regardless of the person's rage and accusations, Marnak stayed calm. He politely questioned her about why she had the Spider Queen encircling Kelton. The woman screamed at him, questioning why she needed to let him know. When Marnak tapped her shoulder and repeated his question, the woman remained silent. She asked him what he was going to do next after telling him she wouldn't tell him even if she died. Confused, the woman said that Marnak understood. He chopped off her head without thinking, took the divinity from her, and gained 1,000 divinity. As Marnak put away his sword, he pondered the number of worshippers who could reveal the real meaning of everything to them. According to the Mother of Corruption, it's more than free, and Martink declared with confidence that he would wager on four. Upon his return to Kendall City, Marnak discovered that the city was completely destroyed by fire and that there was no longer any chance to save it. Lord Strin was killed by demon worshippers somewhere in Kelton City. The black-haired woman Parna felt that the people who had defended Lord Strin had wasted their valuable time and was therefore irritated with them. When the man asked her about the incarnation, the woman replied that it was unstable because it was hard to extract divinity from living things. She went on to say that even though it wasn't completely prepared, someone's presence caused them to lose a few runaways. Parney felt offended by her friend's remark and clarified that she hadn't purposefully started the conflict and had actually given it her all. She clarified that there wouldn't have been any runaways if it weren't for the two strong monks and the teaching sect member interfering. Parna hypothesized that the runaways would not have succeeded in escaping in the end if Layla had sent a few spiders. It dawned on the woman wearing the eye patch that Layla was still missing. Parna remarked that Layla had squandered time with those spiders before. The man stepped in and told them to stop fighting because it was pointless. He clarified that since there was now a single escapee, the mercenary guild along with the neighboring cities would gather forces to pursue them. He highlighted the years they'd spent figuring out how to make the plan work. Pranta, displeased with the man's domineering demeanor, vented her ire and reminded him that she had also devoted three years of her own time. The woman with the eye patch decided to evaluate the situation outside in an effort to distress and prevent Parna. But Parna kept expressing her frustration, so the man had to step in and tell her to stop. He promised Parna that he would make sure Layla was held accountable for the runaway's deaths. Panda, startled by his unexpected arrival, gasped before quickly swinging his weapon and beheading the woman wearing the eye patch. Panoramic at the act's savagery, Parna stood motionless, stunned. Parna turned to the man standing next to the deceased woman without pausing to think. The whole thing happened so fast that Parnia had trouble comprehending what had happened. In a conversation with the mother of corruption, Martinak shares his opinion that killing a third party without first posing any questions is unfair. He tells her that those were people with the power to control divinity, potentially endangering his health in some way. Parni gets perplexed as to why Martinak is conversing with himself. Calling Parna, Marnak asked her why she was encircling Kelton. In response to his inquiry, Prana gave him all the information that she knew. After hearing from Panda, Marnak learned that the evil spirit's adherents desired to sacrifice every person living in the city and produce a ball of divinity known as the Incarnation. The evil spirit's worshippers had spent the previous three years hiding out in the city in order to carry out their scheme. Even though they needed five more days to prepare, they had to move quickly because Carmen was able to break free from their custody. Parna led Marnak to the location of the Divinity Ball. When they first saw it, Marnak was taken aback and admitted that it was better than he had anticipated. Parna inquired as to his intentions as he readied his sword. Before it awoke, Marnak told Parna that he intended to destroy the monster that had eaten the flesh and blood of helpless people. Manak did not hesitate to attack the Ball of Divinity, even in spite of Parna's warning not to. When Parna saw that Marnak was putting the monster in danger inside the Ball of Divinity, she yelled a warning that doing so might cause it to awaken in an unstable state. Out of the Ball of Divinity came a monster with only one eye that screamed in pain to let others know how much it was hurting. Marnak felt a smile come to his face, sensing that the monster held a holy relic. He considered offering the creature as a sacrifice to the Mother of Corruption because he thought it would give him more power. Parnia was incensed as she questioned Martinak about his actions. But before she could say anything more, Marnak chopped off her head, earning her 1,000 divinity. This brought Marnak's total divinity to 8,582. With the help of the demon worshippers, Martinak was able to take Lordstrom's divinity. Now, he only needed about 10,000 divinity to gain a new authority. The monster would just keep growing back even when Marnak tried to kill it with Slayer. But if he allowed the creature to continue attacking him, he would ultimately lose. Furthermore, it lacks a definite weakness similar to the Spider Queen because it resembles an insubstantial mass of flesh. After assessing the circumstances, Martinak concluded that leaving was his only realistic choice. With barely enough divinity left to reach his next level of authority, he made the decision to flee and gather as much divinity as he could from the dead people scattered all over the place. A thrilling race against time ensued as the unrelenting monster chased after him. 
Would Marnak successfully gain his new authority before the creature caught him, or would the other way around? The sound of the monster's piercing scream resounded like a voice from heaven, making Marnak stop his runaway and cover his ears. The monster threw its tentacles violently at Marnak, destroying the earth beneath them. Quickly dodging the creature's blow, Marnak pleaded with the Mother of Corruption for help. She called forth the corruption giant in retaliation, and it launched a terrible attack on the creature that caused a massive explosion. After the debris settled, Marduk gritted his teeth and admitted that he knew that one corruption giant would not be enough. With a look of resolve in his eyes, he warned the giant of corruption not to overwork itself and promised to be back soon. He looked around him, looking for the corpses of skilled knights or elite soldiers that he could harvest deities from. He was looking for corpses when he happened upon some dead people unexpectedly laying close to a blazing flame. But the mother of corruption had been around for too long to take the essence from those corpses. A wave of regret passed over him when he realized that, in his quest to find the evil spirit's worshippers, he ought to have extracted the divinity from those bodies sooner. Right now, he had accumulated 9,237 divinity, just shy of the threshold needed to gain another authority. Something exploded not far from him. With a quick reflex, Marnak tightened his grip on his sword and warded off the attacks. However, the creature did not give up and launched another attack from above, causing the ground to collapse under Marnak's feet. Mayak took a step back and braced himself, realizing fast that the monster's strength had increased after its run-in with the corruption giant. The creature launched a flurry of tentacle attacks, but Marnak deftly cut through each one, taking the monster by surprise and stopping its attack momentarily. As Marnak lunged towards the creature, prepared to attack, an epiphany struck him. He saw that the creature was strategically biding its time, waiting for him to get close. Before he could respond, the creature's tentacles entangled Marnak, slamming him to the ground. The mother of corruption showed concern and asked how Martinek was doing as he lay on the ground. Manek reassured her that he was fine and that he was lucky. He remembered the evil spirit worshipper's statement about the people who stood up for Lordstrin, and he became aware that he was standing there right now. He gave the Mother of Corruption the order to take all the divinities from the bodies strewn across the floor, armed with his newly discovered scheme. Martinak waited patiently as the Mother of Corruption started to absorb the divinities from the dead bodies. At last, he accomplished the feat of becoming 10,001 Divine. Without delay, Marnak begged the Mother of Corruption to grant him a new authority by offering her 10,000 divinity. The monster became confused, not knowing what was happening as a black energy began to radiate and engulf the area. A grin slowly appeared on Marnak's face as he approached the creature with casual abandon. He assured the monster that things had changed and that it would now experience far more suffering and agony than he had ever experienced. He did this with conviction. Marnak's recently acquired power. All corruption had the horrifying power to progressively destroy any living thing that came into contact with it. Remarkably, Marnak himself was not immune to its effects, but he developed a talent known as Text of Corruption that allowed him to control the power of his authority. This gave him the ability to strategically identify the parts of his opponent's bodies that weren't needed for combat by choosing which ones would deteriorate first. After cutting off the monster's arm, Marnak was left to reflect on which was happening more quickly, the monster's regeneration or the corruption as a whole. Nevertheless, he triumphed, defeating the beast and taking possession of the desired sacred artifact. Presenting the relic to the Mother of Corruption, a remarkable event occurred, a bright light filled the area, and then peace returned. As Marnak studied the holy relic, it dawned on him that the Mother of Corruption's hand had seemingly disappeared. Rather, a small girl was in front of him. Confused, Marnak couldn't help but wonder if she was the Mother of Corruption brought to life. The Mother of Corruption approached Marnak, perplexed as to why she had taken on the appearance of a child. In response, Marnak told her that she ought to know the answer, but she remained silent. Franzak was unwilling to let such a precious resource go to waste, so he asked the Mother of Corruption if there was a way to draw the godliness of another god from the dead incarnation that was on the ground. The Mother of Corruption tried her best, but she was unable to draw the divinity from the departed incarnation. Warnak comforted her, saying she didn't have to try too hard if it didn't work out, and advised her to go back for the time being. The Mother of Corruption welcomed Marnak back and told him that it was unlikely that the divinity could be extracted from the dead incarnation because the divinities were entangled and blended together. The Mother of Corruption's expression betrayed her frustration at not being able to extract the desired divinity. With the holy relic in his possession and 10,000 divinity, Marnak had broken the seal of the Mother of Corruption and presented the relic to her, pleading with her for a newfound authority. A brilliant light surrounded them as he held out the relic, heralding the arrival of a new ruler on Marnak. Intrigued by the newfound power bestowed upon him, Manak questioned the corruption's mother. She replied in a cryptic way, telling him to use it however much or as little as he wanted. Mercuriously intrigued by her cryptic remark, Marnak asked her to elaborate on her meaning. A thought persisted in Martinak's mind as they set out on their expedition. 
he was unable to resist thinking about how powerful his newfound authority was and whether it was too strong for him. Deeply in thought, Martinek considered the nature of the power that had been placed upon him, the so-called curse of corruption. He realized that this power was inherently evil since it could progressively rot and decompose any living thing within an area the size of a small city. If they were already dead or evil, Marnak would be cool with it, but he doesn't want to kill innocent people in order to become divine. He came to the conclusion that the holy relic holding the mother of corruption's sealed divinity might not be a coincidence. Many ideas raced through Marnak's mind, one of which was that the incarnation may have been motivated by the divinity of the mother of corruption. After being hit by an excessive amount of divine-infused attacks, Martinek's body could take no more and he fell to the ground to lose consciousness. Ten days went by before Martinek was able to come back to consciousness. Upon seeing him awake, Carmen, the first person he saw, expressed a great sense of relief. When Marnak felt his chest, he immediately realized that the mother of corruption's hand, which was usually placed there, was missing. He asked Carmen, in a panic, where his things had disappeared to. Manak was clearly upset, so Karen gently told him to calm down before going on to explain the circumstances. But instead of listening to Carmen's attempts to soothe him, Manak grew angrier and demanded to know where his possessions were. When he heard about the mother of corruption, he suddenly lost all patience. Marnak thought he had lost the hand, and a wave of relief swept over him. Karen went on to say that he had retrieved the hand when others had tried to discard it because he felt there was a deeper significance attached to it. Marnak was ecstatic and conveyed to Karak his sincere appreciation for what he had done. Feeling a little shy, Carmen graciously declined Manak's gratitude, calling it unimportant. Karen continued by admitting that he would not have survived the experience in Kelton if it weren't for Martinak's enormous sacrifice. Martinak became curious and started to wonder where they were. McCarthy answered, letting him know that they were still living in Kelton. Upon processing the news that he had been unconscious for ten days, Marnak learned that he was the only person who had survived inside Kelton's heart. Meanwhile, an unidentified bandit tried to escape in the area close to Kelton City but was quickly rendered unconscious by a sharp dagger. The woman, who was known as the Torch Sex Blue Flame, went up to the apprehended bandit who had attempted to flee. The woman unsheathed her sword as she closed on the bandit. The helpless outlaw begged for forgiveness and the taking of his life. But the woman was unmoved by his entreaties, and she quickly and without hesitation beheaded the bandit. The woman showed her strength by engulfing the bandit's corpse in a strong blue flame and destroying it with it. When the other bandits saw their comrade's horrific demise, all they could do was turn away because they couldn't believe what had happened to their friend. The remaining bandits obediently followed the torch sex blue flame, which ordered them to advance. The woman and the bandits reached Kelton City following a protracted journey across the vast area covered in snow. When they arrived at their target, the bandit leader identified the group as the Snow Bear Bandits. They went up to the city guards and respectfully asked to be put in jail. Okay, the city guard replied, but he told the woman that the reason Lord Kelton had offered the rewards was because evil spirit worshippers had killed him. Consequently, she would not receive the rewards for approximately a day. The city guard also told her that Martinek had killed the demon worshippers along with the monsters they had made. He added that after the fierce battle, Marnak had been sleeping for ten days and had just recently woken up. The woman asked the city guard if she could find the squishy demon slayer, Marnak, living in Kelton. The woman went up to the men inside and asked them where Marnak was right now in the city of Kelton. But laughter and a chorus of appreciation for Manak's amazing feats greeted her question. Lord Tradon had told Manak a few days prior that the mysterious blue-haired priest from the sect of Sacred Flame had been actively looking for him. Upon hearing this news, Marnak went into high alert. When it seemed as though the woman knew that he had survived, Marnak asked Lord Tradon. Lord Tradon responded by pointing out that the woman appeared unsure. He warned Marnak, though, that the strong-willed woman with the blue hair would not give up until she found him. The mother of corruption had warned Marnak about the woman with blue hair's relentless pursuit, so that evening, Marnak and Carmen left the city quickly. But even with that, Manak already knew that this woman was the strongest person he had ever met. She received an incredible four and a half fingers. Manak thanked Carmen for her quick agreement to leave at such short notice. Carmen comforted him, telling him he would prefer to leave as soon as possible rather than draw too much attention from the city. Now, two weeks later, Martinak and Carmen were walking to a nearby city. Carmen abruptly called Marnak to let him know that a carriage was approaching. Carmen expressed his suspicion that he had seen the carriage crest, the recognizable white camellia flower seal, which belongs to the distinguished Iremal family. When Marnak asked Carmen if she was really talking about the powerful High Lords of the South, the Iremal family, she answered simply yes. Then, realizing how close they were, Martin asked Carmen if they ought to greet the oncoming carriage. Carmen reasoned that since the carriage did not have the Lord's flag flying, it was likely being driven by a Lord's relative or child. Considering that, he thought it might be a good idea for them to stealthily get around the carriage. After the carriage drove by, Marnak felt that there was someone in a restraint inside. 
he informed Carmen of his observation right away. The man at the head of the abduction gave his men orders to kill Martinak and Carmen. When the kidnappers surrounded Marnak and Carmen, they valiantly retaliated by setting off a powerful explosion. Frank and Carmen took advantage of the confusion and killed two of the kidnappers in quick succession, surprising the leader and his men with their easy victory. The commander yelled, wanting to know what his men were doing and wanting them to get this situation resolved as soon as possible. The confrontation came to an end when Martinak and Carmen defeated the other kidnappers after a short while. Carmen asked Markak if he had been able to get the name of the person they had saved, adding that the person they had saved was throwing up at the moment. In response to Carmen, Marnak stated that their current situation precluded any questioning. The white-haired woman asked Marnak to stop patting her back, explaining that if he kept on, she would feel like throwing up. The oldest child of Kaltu Iremel is Dekia Iremel. Grinning, the young master thanked Carmen and Martinek from the bottom of her heart for saving her. Carmen mused in silence to himself that she had to be a mage if she was, in fact, Dekia, the happy young master's daughter. The moment Marnak realized that Dekia was a mage, he couldn't help but think that she would be extremely rude. Karen murmurs to Martinek, Dekia truly has a big heart, to which Martinek nods in agreement. Pretending to be a priest dedicated to the worship of the goddess of preservation, Marnak introduced himself as Marnak when Dekia asked him the name of her savior. Dekia remarked that she thought the name Marnak was pretty appropriate. Asiya politely asked Marnak for help since she was having trouble walking because of the residual effects of the anesthetic gas she had been made to breathe. She explained that the gas was still in her system. Carmen introduced himself as Carmen Valtes, the son of Sir and his Valtes, and graciously offered to help Dekia. Dekia, on the other hand, asked Carmen if he was certain he would assist her. She clarified that in the unlikely event that unidentified witnesses saw the black prairie dog belonging to the Valtes family with her. And she reasoned that if that information made it to the capital, Carmen would undoubtedly be worried about someone he loved who lived there. Dekia further mentioned that she wished to at least be considerate. When Martinak and Carmen learned that Dekia was a noble in addition to a mage, they were shocked. Manak could not bring himself to think that a noble mage could truly care about other people. Carmen wanted to know more about what had happened before Dekia was abducted. Dekia clarified that although she didn't have conclusive proof, she had a gut feeling that her hated brother Derso Iremel was responsible for the planned kidnapping. Carmen found it hard to accept that Dekia's brother had planned the kidnapping. Dekia informed them that the Dragon Kingdom had proposed to her recently. Her brother intended to utilize the proposal as an excuse to get rid of her because she was the next in line to become the family head. Marnak reflected to himself that mages are initially unwelcome by nobles. Indeed, nobility generally detests mages, especially those who are born into noble families, as they find it offensive when mages are associated with their family. The innate characteristics of mages are the first obvious cause. They are not only difficult to train in manners, but they also have a tendency to be self-centered. Their increased authority as nobility frequently causes problematic mishaps that are challenging to fix. There is another old folktale that explains why mages shouldn't be given positions of authority. This story has been passed down through the generations and predates the ancient empire. It centers on the time when corrupt magery was common. Most species in this world dislike it when mages hold positions of power because of their ingrained belief in this tale. Because of this, when Dekia told them she wanted to run for one of the four High Lord positions in the Northern Kingdom, Marnak thought it would be impossible to succeed unless she killed her own brother, which seemed highly unlikely. Manak was curious as to how Dekia would manage to complete this seemingly unachievable task. Dekia asked the two if they were still listening to her story after she noticed that Marnak was getting bored with hearing it. Carmen was thinking back on the tale that Dekia had told them, while Marnak was busy grilling the meat. Dekia had revealed that she had a suspicion, which she later verified, that those in her immediate vicinity were trying to set up her marriage to the Dragon Kingdom. Manak told Dekia that they had really made an effort to hear her story. But, it was getting harder for Marnak to stay focused and pay attention because Dekia had already told her story three times. Marnak swapped out the grilled meat for Dekia's burnt preparation. Dekia was touched by Martinak's act of kindness and felt appreciative. As he passed the meat to Dekia, Martinak expressed his belief that she would get better at grilling in the future. But he also told her that, in order to get better results, she should talk less when cooking. Dekia surprised everyone by making an offer that Martin thought she might make. She requested that they go with her to Betis, which is a part of the Iremal family's domain. Marnak was completely stunned when she told him that if they could get her there, she would give them their weight in gold. With a sly smile, Marnak thought about how the High Lord's family must be extremely amazing and giving. But Martinak understood the problem at hand. Since Marnak is currently Carmen's client and top priority, going with Dekia would mean postponing Carmen's search for his mother. Considering how Carmen had prevented the mother of the corruption's hand from being totally burned, Marnak thought back. 
Taking this into account, Marnak made the decision to respect Carmen's choice to proceed westward and to forego the chance to acquire the promised gold from Dekia. Carmen showed that he understood Dekia's predicament by clenching his fist tightly. He understood that they had committed to getting involved, so it was their duty to see it through to the end. Carmen underlined that there was no other way to preserve the Valtis' name's honor. After a long day of traveling, Martinac and the others spotted a nearby village early the next morning. Their hopes were raised that they would get to take a warm bath. They arrived at an inn where, to their luck, Carmen was able to book rooms for them on the third floor at the end of the hallway. He went so far as to ask that bath water be ready for them. Once they had taken a cool bath, the innkeeper made Marnak and his friends a delicious dinner. In these situations, Marnak couldn't help but feel as though he wished he had a sense of taste. Martinak and his friends saw a woman being harassed by some of the other guests while they were eating. The man was making a disturbance and harassing the woman at the inn, so the innkeeper tried to step in and stop him. But the man countered that all he was asking was for the woman to pour them a drink and hear their story. Carmen warned Marnak that there was probably going to be fighting and asked if they should step in. Marnak brought up the fact that Dekia had already taken matters into her own hands and was currently confronting the man face to face and punching him. As Carmen handled the last individual engaged in the altercation, Martinak firmly pressed the other man's face against the table. Dekia took a moment to clarify that ever since she was a small child, she had felt obligated to act when she saw injustice or wrongdoing. Marnak stared at Dekia, thinking that she was not prone to outbursts. Instead, it was a deeply rooted sense of moral obligation that drove her to take action in these circumstances. Marnak received the money from Carmen, who had discreetly taken it from the unconscious person. In response, Marnak gave the innkeeper the stolen money and gave them instructions to use it for replacing any broken items and fixing any damages brought on by the altercation. Manak entered Dekia's room that evening, grabbed her face, and pushed her up against the wall. Dekia was instructed to keep quiet so as to keep Carmen from waking up. Manak told Dekia not to pay attention if they saw any unfair behavior because they were being pursued. He forewarned Dekia that Marnak would have to hurt her and give her up to their assailants if she disregarded his advice once more. He asked Dekia to nod slowly to show that she understood. Upon seeing Dekia nod, Manak bid her farewell and exited her chamber. He now had faith that Dekia would talk to him and act wisely in the future. The mother of corruption expressed worry about how hurriedly Marnak was acting. But Martinak insisted that the matter had to be addressed before it became more serious. He thought the time had come to find out if Dekia Irmal actually suffered from obsessive-compulsive disorder. Metis Draco, the third prince of the Dragon Kingdom, received a report from Hilden, the eastern regional manager of the clandestine organization known as Isla, about the failed efforts to apprehend Dekia. Hilden stated that unanticipated circumstances had surfaced and added that more financing would be needed to carry out the mission. Metis Draco bemoaned his frustration, saying he had given Hilden a sizable sum of money already. He gave Hilden a firm slap across the face after insisting that he come near him. Metis Draco then gave Hilden instructions to give a thorough justification for the extra expenses, but he warned him that disclosing the cause of the excessive losses would have dire repercussions. Hilden, motivated by his love for his family and the sense that his life was in danger, bowed and knelt before Metis Draco. He went on to say that the priest Marnak, who revered the goddess of preservation, was to blame for the inability to apprehend Dekia. Hilden's explanation incensed Vetus Draco, who wondered if it was all because of a single priest's actions. Hilden made it clear, however, that Manak was no typical priest. He related a spectacular deed in which Marnak used just one sword to vanquish a demon that had changed into an enormous monster in Guiz. Furthermore, Hilden disclosed that recently in Kelton, Marnak had defeated a hideous being fashioned by the adherents of malevolent spirits who had offered innumerable lives in their sinister rites. Having achieved this all by himself, Marnak was dubbed the archenemy of the evil spirit. Vetus Draco discovered that the famous priest and Valtus' eldest son had obtained Dekia after hearing Hilden's explanation. Vetus Draco then reassured Hilden that he would give him more money, which helped to allay Hilden's fears. Vetus Dracula warned Hilden, though, that he would have to be successful on his next try. The mother of corruption had changed into a child, and Marnak was tending to her back at the inn where he and his friends were staying. Wondering if he had been too strict with Dekia, Marnak asked the young one if he ought to have been more forgiving. The mother of corruption replied by asking why Marnak would worry about a woman like Dekia. There was an abrupt knock on the door, breaking their conversation. The mother of corruption quickly folded herself into Marnak's arms. Returning to the state of a simple hand, Marnak asked who the visitor was, to which Dekia replied that it was her. When Devika saw food on Martinak's bed when she went into his room, she wondered if he was eating so late. Manak acknowledged that he was beginning to feel a little peckish. Dekia said she had to talk to him about something important while Martinak was setting the food on the table. Seated on the bed, Dekia asked Marnak directly if being a mage was the reason he had given her such a strong warning. Martinak nodded subtly, confirming her suspicion. 
Deki aside, admitting that she had expected his response. She revealed that she was used to seeing herself with those eyes as Marnek gazed at her. It was a new experience for Dekia, but many who had suffered at the hands of mages had looked at her the same way. Even though there was a glint of jealousy in Martinak's eyes, his remarks were centered on their future friendship and how Dekia ought to work on herself. Even though he was being serious, Martink felt a little awkward about telling her what he expected from her. Dekia admitted that she had trouble ignoring unfair events if she were to witness them. She did, however, accept Martinak's recommendation that they talk about these things going forward. Dekia pledged to try to heed his counsel and ask for his direction when dealing with such circumstances. Just as Dekia turned to leave, she heard Marnek call out to her. He said he was sorry for treating her so badly and rudely earlier. Dekia was relieved and grateful for Marnak's heartfelt apology. She was relieved that Marnak was at last viewing her in a new light. Dekia began to get excited and look forward to her next adventure with Marnak. Following their chat, Manak went back to tending to the mother of corruption in his quarters. Suddenly, Marnak was sleeping at the inn when a group of people arrived. Among them was a bald man who kicked the door open with such force and made a loud demand to know where Martinak was. With a confident demeanor, he vowed to kill everyone in the room if they failed to bring him Marnak. At this moment, the person who was sitting in the tent was looking at a certain letter, he understood that it was definitely rubbish. This was the same commander, he understood that the girls have that would still be normal, but nothing more, they would definitely not be able to cope with more. He knew that the same girl with silver hair and golden eyes would not be caught by them. But then he wondered what kind of priest he was talking about. In fact, this person was also looking at a photo of our main character. The photo was hastily drawn, but even so, it was possible to remember the main features of the face. He knew the nicknames, or even titles, that our hero received, it was written sworn enemy of evil spirits. It can be seen that the person was quite upset that he would most likely have to deal with such a person, and also learned that our protagonist's name is Marduk. But at this moment, while the guard was looking at this picture, a voice called out to him from the side. Sajida turned around and noticed that one of his subordinates had come to see him. There was a look of horror on his face, as well as haste. He was dressed rather poorly, but he was still a small detail in this horde. He was shouting that the priest had finally arrived, but the main problem was that the reaper had come without the girl herself. Sajida immediately made a face and began to ask where the priest was, why he wasn't in his tent yet, if his party had attacked him without his knowledge. But they were interrupted by the fact that they were both looking away now, and it was clear from the messenger that he had seen the priest, and with him his companion, who was being held. The soldier begged to be released, but the priest held him only with one hand, grabbing him by the throat. But then Sajid himself intervened, asking for the release of his comrade, as well as other allies. They were all armed with weapons, ready to attack the priest, but only Sajida could sense the problem of the situation. He realized that it was better to start solving something now, so he shouted in the direction of our main character and his team, he asked them all to lower the gun as quickly as possible. It was quite loud, and all the comrades listened to it, immediately lowered their weapons and stood to the side. Sajid also snapped his teeth, annoyed, because he knew that his companions should have stopped nodding off earlier while he was still talking. He knew they were in huge trouble, with a priest on their doorstep. The two characters exchanged their gazes, so that in a few seconds both of them were already looking at each other. Sajid, making a kind and calm face, asked his companion if his name was really Marduk. Our protagonist immediately said that everything is so, and also made a kind face. Sajida realized that this was the most likely way to get through to our protagonist, so he asked him to lower the one in his hand a little. At the same time, the person who was in the air fell to the ground, and our character said that he only wanted to meet with the captain of the mercenary group. Sajida was confused at first, and then, looking at Marnak, replied that the Red Bear captain was standing in front of him. He tried to make as few mistakes as possible in his first introduction, so he introduced himself as Sajida. A few minutes later, they were both sitting at the same table. Sajida offered a cup of alcohol to his guest, but Marnak, without changing his principles, refused, which was very annoyed by Sajida himself. Sajida was upset because he wanted to appease his guest a little with this gift. Sajida drank a mug of alcohol for courage and then loudly put the cup on the table. He knew he had no choice and then he listened. Marnak smiled and said that one of the colleagues of the man in front of him had come to see him early that morning. The man broke in through the door, almost broke it, and then started raving about how he wanted to meet them. Sajida began to rub his head, realizing that most likely his men had definitely done something wrong, and most likely yesterday's fight was a cause for concern. Sajida didn't know what to do. Was he going to have to say it out right now, or was he going to have to test the waters again? Should I tell them they were looking for the beautiful girl with the silver hair? After all, they do all this just at the request of the organization or, which cursed them. Sajida, looking at his companion, was afraid to say a word. The priest generally looked rather dangerous, or more precisely, Bakte. 
Just because of the rumors, a quarrel with a priest would definitely scare everyone. Sajida knew once again that he was in deep trouble, but he also knew that it was all the fault of Captain Pelguin, who didn't keep his mouth shut. Sajid's lips tightened in annoyance, but as he thought of Pelguin, the captain himself appeared in the distance. Pelguin looked like he was drunk, clearly out of his mind. As soon as he appeared, he immediately made it clear to everyone that either they would listen to him, or he'll start another riot. As soon as he reached the tent, he pushed aside a man who was not even in his way, and then asked if the priest himself had come at his command. He was told that he had come, which made Pelvin reproach him for his courage. The penguin immediately approached our main character and addressed him, calling him little brother. He asked if it was Marnak himself. Our character replied that it was true, so the captain started asking about the girl who has silver hair. Our hero immediately replied that he was not mistaken, he began to lower his voice a little, he thought that everything would be fine, there would be no problems. But the penguin immediately made it clear that they shouldn't have believed in him so much. He began to ask for the return, or rather to give him the very girl in question. Sajida was just shocked that he knew what a mess they were both going to be in with their captain right now. He understood that now his captain would do something wrong, which happened, the captain began to threaten our protagonist. But if the captain is so bold, then he will not mind getting hit. The second the captain suggested such a course of action, his hand flew off his shoulder and flew to the side. Everyone started to watch this spectacle, no one expected such a lightning-fast Akakia from our main character. The captain immediately started screaming in pain, he was terrified. If it wasn't for the alcohol, he would definitely have fallen to his knees and passed out. But Marnak just stood over him and told him that even he couldn't remember the moment when he had told him his name. Sajida looked at it all with utter despair in his eyes, the captain also couldn't believe what had just happened, he was only trying to crawl towards his severed hand. But Marnak only continued to say that he would not tolerate such treatment. At the same time, the captain looked up at our character, wondering who was standing in front of him. In general, who wants to track them down, do such actions? Sajida shouted and prayed to God while all his comrades and accomplices ran to one place. They knew their captain's arm had been blown off. They all wanted to help their captain as quickly as possible, they thought they could defeat the number that was clearly on their side. But as soon as they entered the battle, they realized that their forces were not equal, they were cut by our main character with just a swing of his blade. At this point, they began to wait for the priest himself to come out to meet them. Our character was about to finish, while the captain himself lay on the floor and begged his sajid to help him. He begged for mercy as our protagonist's sword came closer and closer to his neck. Marnak, for his part, didn't see the point in letting such a drunk live, since he probably wouldn't even want to say anything. His sword was already close to the captain's face, neck, but it was prevented by the fact that Sajida decided to intervene with his spear. Marnak could not believe that he would interfere, because it was clear that Sajida was terrified of our Marnak. Of course, Marnak tried to stay in a good mood, there was a smile on his face that could only mean fear of the unknown. But still he understood that he could not just leave a group of people, a group of people already related to him, with whom he had been together for 15 years. Immediately, the battle between our character and the enemy began. Sajida's spear repeatedly tried to pierce the younger protagonist, but the latter gracefully dodged. He couldn't get hit by any of the blows, and then he was even able to knock the spear out of his opponent's hands. There was nothing left for Sajida to do but use whatever he had at hand, or rather try to evade with his cloak, and then escape. He succeeded, so as soon as he was able to get out of the battle, he asked all his comrades to run away in different directions. No one was able to react in time, so in a few seconds our protagonist ran through them. All the Tudis began to see that every part of their bodies was rising into the air, blood was gushing everywhere, and many were running, but they couldn't keep up. Our character, who is much faster, immediately flies into them. At the same time, we can see Sajida, who chased forward to escape as far as possible, but clearly decided to go back out. They understood that the priestesses needed to be brought into the light, because the one who sent this chase after them was our character. Our main character was just standing in the tent, showing with all his appearance that he was ready to take on another opponent, as if mocking everyone. At the same time, Sajida decided that he had to start a fight, he had to start a battle to win. He mustered all his strength in his spear throw, thinking that he would pierce everything that was in his way. But this time Marnak found a way out, so as not to even loiter, he just took and exposed the body of one of his allies, already dead, Sajid. Sajida was about to launch another attack, but then he only saw the sword of our main protagonist, who removed the dead body from him. Sajida decided to run away as quickly as possible, he thought that he would be able to escape, but this time our main character decided to catch up with his opponent, which he did. The sword and weapon clashed again, and Sajida knew that it was an unequal battle, that he would not succeed. He thought that all he had to do was detain the priest while his captain was in that very tent. He asked everyone who was standing nearby to help his captain, who was clearly not in the best condition. 
but when Sajida decided to make another attack, Marnak was able to miss it and charge his attack with his fist. Marnak was smiling because his punch couldn't kill his opponent with a single punch. He knew that it had been a long time since he had been able to fight an opponent who could withstand his blow. And so it turned out, our protagonist's punch went through Sajida's body, but not in such a way as to kill him, he only dented the armor. Sajida gritted his teeth, probably in pain, and shouted at his men to shoot. Marnak couldn't believe it, could it have been an archer? Our main character decided to jump out of the way, because there will definitely be problems if the arrow breaks through someone's joint, or something like that. Both men jumped out of the way. Sajida thought that everything would work out now, but after looking around, he realized that there were no more of his people left. He started shouting in frustration until Marnak asked him if they would continue. Sajida asked him what he meant by that. But Marnak only smiled again and said that it was more and more like his opponent had been left to fend for himself. As it turned out, Sajida decided to put down his weapon, then stand up and bow his head, saying that he surrendered. He decided to talk about everything, but at the same time asked to leave his life. By that time, quite a few hours had passed, and there were already crosses on this field. Sajit was told that he wanted to save that Kalguin and beat him to a pulp, but now that he's dead, he feels strange. As the two opponents stood looking at the field that was filled with crosses, Markin asked if Sajida hated him. Sajida couldn't understand what he was talking about, so he turned in his direction and said that most likely, if he answered positively, he would be killed or something. But Markin just smiled again and asked if there was any point in letting someone who harbored hatred live. Sajida, gritting his teeth once again, said that it was actually true. At this point, he confessed that he wasn't very good at such things, so it would be quite difficult. He said that the law of mercenaries is to kill or be killed. He said that there were times when he had to work with people that only yesterday his partners were killed. It doesn't mean he's close to them or anything like that. But even with an axe, he definitely did not attack such people. For this reason, he will definitely not hate our main character. It's just that he feels a little lonely, and in any case, this mercenary group was a failure from the very beginning. Marnak immediately asked him what he was going to do in that case. But Sajida didn't know either, because he hasn't felt alone in 15 years, so that's why he's a little confused. He spent his entire life fighting nothing but battles, so he thinks that in the end he will still return to this work. Marnak took a deep breath of the air that enveloped him and said that if so, then he offered to meet with the employer, who would pay a lot of money. Sajida couldn't understand what his last opponent was talking about again. He apologized and also asked for some background information. After a few moments, we can see the girl herself, who is clearly displeased with their team's behavior, glaring first at the priest and then at Sajid. The priest understood that the situation was obviously not very good. He asked what they were not eating, did he smell blood on him, or something like that. But the girl only said that he probably washed her very well, because she doesn't feel anything. Our hero immediately began to go through all the options, but stopped at the fact that most likely he was able to leave without asking. As soon as he said this, the girl said that it was just like that. She said that they hoped that they had strengthened their bond, but realized that it was most likely misunderstood. She understood that it was the priest who had said that she should curb whatever she was about to do. And it was immediately after this incident, without any discussion, that he stopped them of his own volition. The priest immediately decided to smile and address the girl. He asked her if she had ever killed a human being. The girl was shocked by such a question, she immediately said that no, she had never done such a thing. As soon as she said that, our character said that this was exactly the reason why he didn't bring her with him. He said that it seemed to him that they could not find a compromise in this matter and the fight would be to the death. The girl immediately started shouting that our main character could have warned her in advance because she had a good night's sleep and had breakfast because she didn't think about anything. Our hero at this point immediately began to smile, although he thought that this was also one of the reasons why he went without her, so he decided not to push his luck, saying that now he would warn her. The girl was glad of this answer, so now she was even ready to talk in the evenings and discuss the future day together. But while they were talking, the girl was called from the side, it was the same guy who shouted that Marnak went to talk to the mercenaries they met yesterday. He said they should take up arms, but at the same time, he noticed that all the people were sitting in front of them, as well as Marnak. The guy was shocked, because did the person really come back? The guy asked who was at the table with them. But our protagonist said it was a mercenary hired by the princess, so why don't they get to know each other? The girl, looking at how both people greeted and shook hands, could not believe that our main protagonist trusts that very person so much. So I very much hope that this trust is justified. Sajida scratched his head, but the guy said that he was very glad that he had met such a strong companion, and then immediately asked him to forgive him, because he had to go back to the blacksmith shop. He had already rushed here while picking out arrowheads, but the sun was already high, so he thinks they can get out early tomorrow morning. At this point, we can see a certain girl with purple hair. She couldn't figure out when they would leave. Everyone was constantly trying to calm her down, or something, 
but the girl kept whining. The guy with the mustache asked if they were really going to see him now. Was it possible that if this continued, he would be driven mad by the screams of the girl who was now lying on the floor? However, the red-haired guy said that it's coming soon, that he's already checking all their locations regularly, so he's confident. As soon as he said this, the girl immediately broke into a smile. She asked when they would come then, would they really come to erotica itself? But the guy already said that he was answering, why didn't she hear and believe him? The guy sat down to read his book, and the girl started shouting that she believed every word the guy said. However, she immediately put on her face of malice and replied that if things went wrong, the person would have to die for their trembling, that she would tear them to pieces, she was clearly speaking in all seriousness. By that time, the silver-haired girl was very happy, she was talking about finally coming. She was glad not just that she had come to this city, but that now she could take a hot bath. At the same moment, when a group of our heroes approached the gate, a certain person came out to meet them, who asked if it was a priest. Our main character replied that he was a priest, so after a few seconds this person started begging our priest. He began to take him by the hand and shout that he should go to the trumpeter of peace, that he did not even listen to the Lord. The guy was shouting about how he wouldn't stop summoning the army of the dead. The guy says that Onishchenko will pay our main character, but the priest said that he does not think that his words will at least somehow stop that very person, even from the fact that he will stop calling the dead. The guy kept trying to say that he was facing a real priest, that he just had to talk or try. Everyone looked at each other. The guy kept saying that he and the rest of the guards were already at their limit because the dead were walking around almost every day, every night. They said it was too scary. It was obvious that the man was already on edge, that he was begging the whole squad to help him. The priest, looking at this face, immediately turned to the man, saying that he should not count on much, but still they would try to help. The man immediately thanked our reaper and then asked his squad to wait for him or leave without him because he could catch up with everyone. The girl wasn't worried, she said that since that was the case, they would go and find shelter. By that time, our priest had already gone to that very forest, and he understood that among the many priests of various gods, the trumpeters of peace stood out the most. Other gods choose their own priests who are given power, but the trumpeters of death and rest on a random day for no particular reason are random people who receive power. Only the chosen ones always choose the path of the trumpeter. They devote their lives to the service of death. But why do they agree? Of course, this is a riddle that no one knows the answer to. Pipes just pop up in places with a lot of corpses, blow silent pipes, raise the dead, who follow him like an army. Most of the rulers look down on this phenomenon. Of course, this is expected, but still none of them tries to touch the dead man, led by Tubular. This is the logic, no one will want to resist the army of the dead, which can increase indefinitely. It is for this reason that the trumpeters of peace live all alone. They are the ones who appear only to hang around with the dead. Our character understood and wanted to make it clear to everyone that this is more like a natural phenomenon. At the same moment, our hero stood in front of the figure itself, he told him that he knew that many people had already come and gone, but he simply could not refuse the request that was asked of him. It was the priest who came to tell him what he had already heard many, many times. The priest asked if it was time to leave this place in the forest. Our protagonist said that he came for a reason, because the walking dead is not a pleasant sight, but is there any special purpose for finding such a person there? Usually, people like him don't stay in one place that long. Everyone stared at the picture, but the trumpeter only called the man in front of him by his nickname, or rather, a follower of the evil spirit. But at the same time, the trumpeter said that those dead people who stood behind our protagonist will bring a lot of death. Our main character looked there, and then realized that these dead people will soon go to Erratica. Our character was shocked, he asked again, because does the person really want to say that there are followers of evil spirits there? But the trumpeter was silent at first, and then said that everything had already begun. It was at this moment that a certain ray hit the ground. Our protagonist realized that he already had to hurry to get where he needed to go. He knew he couldn't let what had happened at the Hilton happen again. His feet started to run through the snow at an incredible speed, sweat appeared on his face, he didn't want to let those dead people do all the things they did before. At that moment, a certain place was covered in flames. A certain girl we had seen earlier was shouting that the person they were looking for wasn't here at all. But the girl who scratched her head and stood right next to the stone said that very soon they would find the priest, but now, most likely, he was already in another city. The girl with the bright purple hair asked the other lady to die, because she did not fulfill her request, did not keep her word, but the man with the mustache said that they should wait, because most likely the priest was found. The girl was very happy with this information, he asked where the priest is, but the man only said that he was standing a little further away from them. As it happened, Marnak stood in the fire, his eyes glowing. He was clearly angry, perplexed. He didn't think that he would meet the right person right here. Marnak was actually standing in the fire at that moment, unfurling his sword to show that he was serious. The girls were shocked by the sight, 
but Gru just wanted to calm down, he knew that he needed to calm down because the voices wouldn't let him. He knew that if he gathered his forces now, he would definitely be able to defeat the one who had killed his benefactor as well as him. This person was in front of him right now, and he was the one who needed to take revenge. Here are the memories of our main character. He's lying in the snow. He looks up at the sky with his fathomless eyes. For some reason, these were the times he remembered. He understood that he had a lot of strange worries and problems. He tried to reach out for what no one else had returned to. Living day after day, there were times when he couldn't earn anything. He was starving. And in one of those moments, the middleman of the snowpack, something strange happened. He finally met his savior. This man with the scarlet frost belt was called Shantuxa. It was this man who found our protagonist right in the snow, dying of hunger and cold. He just picked him up on his back and carried him in the other direction. He was a middle-aged man, not too young, but not too old either. He was quite a light person, he put our main character on the bed and took care of him, changed rags, constantly monitored the temperature. It was at such important moments that this person simply changed, he became impossibly serious. When our protagonist first woke up with a rag on his forehead, that person didn't ask anything, he just went about his business and said that our character could stay with him until he was sick of living in the same house. This person was a priest, serves the goddess of support, and also a caretaker of a cemetery on the outskirts of the city. One day, when our hero decided to help him with his work, when the shovel was piercing the ground, and on the street the snow was already getting wet, turning into water from the heat, our protagonist asked why he was saved. But Shantuk's dish started to smile and replied that he just wanted to help. Mashtuk's face was slightly flushed, and he didn't know what to say, so he only said what came into his head. The smile that our hero saw that day took a special place in his heart. Shantex always helped others from memories, helped absolutely everyone, and also said that there was no need to look for special reasons for this. Marnak also tried to follow his advice, tried to help people and so on. He wanted to become like his teacher, but nothing worked. A whole year of peaceful life had already come to an end before the next winter arrived. Now our main character has saved a man who lost consciousness and was lying in the snow, just like Marnak on one of the same days, just like Shank saved him. However, this time it could be called a mistake that just managed to be made. After receiving the help of people from the building, the black magician gradually healed, and then with a smile on his face confessed that he was serving an evil spirit. With his magic, he chopped Marnak into pieces, and when our protagonist woke up again, the hand that was burdensome to carry with him somehow got out of the inventory and stroked his cheek. Then, after going a little further, he had to face the actions of his own actions. When he entered one of the rooms, he could see that the body of his teacher, his savior, had been cut into pieces. It was clear that these were the tricks of the black and cursed magician. It was at this point that we returned to the present time. The old man said that now he remembered that this was the same cemetery caretaker. Hearing this, our character was furious, and the black magician continued, saying that it was like the priest had already died last time, so why was he standing in front of him now? Black MG remembered that he had killed the priest with his own hands. Sure enough, at that moment, the black mage asked, is the priest now wearing the robe of his past savior? But if that was the case, then it was time to deal with the priest who was standing right in front of him. Marnak could no longer keep all the aggression to himself, and something that hadn't been there for quite some time appeared on his face. The girl who was standing next to him was also glad that it was Marnak himself who was in front of her now, and she started walking towards him with her hands outstretched, saying that she had heard that he was quite strong. But as soon as her small body reached the level of the sword cut, her body began to be cut by the sword of our main character. This attack was stopped by the black magician himself attacking our character. He said that his opponent is exactly different from what they say about him. But Marnak didn't want to hear anything, he asked the black magician as quickly as possible. After all, Tom didn't have much time left. Marnak extended his hand forward, activating spells. Black Nail was overconfident until his defense collapsed. In an instant, the black mage's hand was sawn off by the sword. And the girl, who a second ago had no body parts with her, already got close to Marshak from behind. Marnak struck at her again, chopping her head off her shoulders. But there was no horror on the girl's face, nothing, just ecstasy from such a performance. The black magician standing to the side decided that it was time to use his skill, Hours of Retribution, which our main character drew attention to. He only stared at what appeared in the sky. A black magician appeared in the sky, clearly ready to destroy all the land beneath him. One second later, a huge beam hit the ground. All of the black mage's companions closed their eyes as they were blown away by a huge explosive aura. Marnak, who was unable to defend properly from this attack, fell to the ground, his strength running out, and the black mage who was standing right in front of him was unharmed. He was talking about the fact that the divine power that he feels from Marnak clearly not from the goddess of support, but the blessing on the priest's clothes hides it well. 
The black magician immediately started saying that this was probably another black spirit follower. Marnak, hearing this, became even more aggressive, he asked the black magician to But the black magician only began to smile even more, he realized that he had hit the bullseye. But Marnak, who could no longer hold anything in himself, asked the black magician to while showing that he was now incredibly angry. His evil spirit appeared right above Farnak, and the black magician only wondered what kind of power it was. The black magician was confident that even if he lost his left arm, he would be able to get a new one. The spirit's huge fist flew towards the black magician, but the latter didn't dodge in any way. The black magician, with the help of a single shield, was able to protect himself from this scourge, making it clear that he was also serious. He was amused by this fight between two owners of evil spirits. Our protagonist, who bowed his head down, recalled that that night he would definitely be able to kill the mage in front of him. Both sides knew that this would be the last battle. At that moment, our main character's assistants were operating in the city itself, which Sajit put at the head. They were hiding out to deal with the dead that were all over the area. They knew that even if they looked dead, they shouldn't underestimate them. Another guy asked me to go back to the castle because it was dangerous to stay in that place. The girl offered to try again to wait for the monsters to get up, but the guy made it clear that these monsters do not just die, that you should not hope that they will be able to deal with him so quickly, that first of all you should find shelter. This city turned into something similar, which could be called a battlefield or terror. The feudal lord's castle appeared before our team. They were standing near her gate. It didn't look like the people were going crazy because of the local lord, but he still asked the lady to warn them that they would have to kill their opponents. The girl knew that this was necessary, so Sajida at the same time pierced one of the zombies with a spear, making it clear that just like that they would not be able to miss everything, or ignore it. Sajida, throwing the corpse from his spear, said that they just have to get out of this city if they want to live. That you need to think that they just pierce pieces of meat, and not people. But while they were discussing all this, the huge crowd that was standing right in front of them started rushing towards them at an incredible speed. The girl immediately took out her own sword and started cutting up the corpses of the people in front of her. The guy, looking at her, realized that he could rely on her, and then the squad began to make their way through the crowd of enemies. At one point, Sajida noticed that something was wrong. The other guy also turned around and noticed that monsters were coming out of the ground, that there was a huge monster in the distance, or someone who looked like a familiar person. By the time the purple-haired girl and her black mage continued their onslaught, they were all thinking that this was fun, they understood that this was the battle they had been craving for a long time. But in that moment, we realized that this familiar figure was our Marnak, who ordered his spirit to attack. The spirit obeyed the order, clenched its fist, and then went into battle directly at the black magician. While the black magician was distracted by the evil spirit's duar, our protagonist decided to draw his sword and head into battle too. Everyone started a fierce battle, everyone transmitted at an incredible speed, but it wasn't enough. The black magician only continued to laugh and sleep, is this really all that our protagonist is capable of? Was that all he could do? Marnak knew that he was not succeeding, but the black magician did not hesitate, he began to use his abilities, saying that his opponent this time was incredibly simple. The black mage was about to strike, but then, for some reason, he fell to the side. At first, our character didn't understand what was going on, and then he noticed the spear that belonged to Sajida. Sajida was standing quite far away, but when he noticed our hero, he started running towards him. Sajida himself wasn't in very good condition, as he was also being chased by monsters. Our man, standing in front of his opponent, looking at his sword, thought that after reading something in the book that revenge is meaningless, he was now standing in front of the magician, who was already lying on the floor, motionless. But can't it make sense? What is the overall result? Was this the end he'd expected? The priest at the same time said that this body that lay in front of him, he donates to his mother. The body began to glow, the spirit began to speak, and the divinity began to overwhelm our protagonist. Was the black magician still alive? But if that's the case, it might be worth getting your right hand back first. Through Sankuta, the saw was taken out of his pocket, and the hand landed in the priest's hand. The priest, looking to the side, noticed that there was a girl who was clearly not happy with this outcome, but her friend was shouting that she had not seen anything, that she was begging to tell her, that I wanted to see it again. But the girl, or rather her friend, immediately began to take her aside, saying that she did not understand what she was talking about, that if this continues, then no one will succeed. At this point, our character, looking at his spirit, told him to throw it in the right place, even if he met death. The spirit took it in its hand, preparing to throw. The girls who ran away thought that they would soon be safe, but they were happy early, because now they were facing our main enemy, who came like a meteor. He stopped, looked into the girl's frightened eyes, and asked what they were doing there. The girl with the purple eyes was obviously pleased to see him, she said her name was Polly, and Vienna was standing next to her. Vienna asked them not to make any noise, 
but the girl confessed that they were often called a secret society. It was obvious that she wasn't lying, that she was actually a follower of the dark spirit. Warnack became wary, and the girl started shouting even more that they belonged in Liberatio. Hurley said that people call them a secret society, and they are followers of evil spirits. This community is called Liberonio. She asked Marnak if he remembered the kids he'd killed recently in Kelton. He said he remembered. Then he said they were all part of Liberatio, too. Hurley said enthusiastically that this was why they were waiting for Marnak here. He asked how many people were in their community. Hurley said she didn't know and came here after being told she could do whatever she wanted. Ben doesn't know either. She is here on the orders of the highest circles of her sect. Then she said that Rivercal probably knew. She pointed to it and said that it was sent directly from Liberatio. However, he couldn't answer Marnak now, he was standing there decapitated. Marnak asked them what Liberatio's goal was. Suddenly Benna stepped forward and said that she could tell them. She said their goal is simple, it's peace. A world where people will be free from the gods, in which no one will persecute you for your views. Then he squeezed his eyes shut. He asked if that was why they did this to the city. And you see that the whole city is on fire. Benna said she didn't want that either, it was just that Rivercal had caused them a lot of trouble. And in general, they collect certain things. One of them is now at Marnex. He asked her what she was talking about. Bina smiled and said that she was talking about a sacred relic. She said that they came for the sphere that was inside the incarnation. The hero's guesses were correct. These people are going to use mother's power somehow, trapped inside sacred relics. Then he said that the sphere was destroyed. Benna didn't believe it and started saying that it was simply impossible and that Marnak was lying. Marnak explained what had happened, and what's left of it can be found now in Kelton, the sphere is broken. Marnak asked how many relics they had, he thought they only had one. At this time, Spoilage's mother became interested in this conversation. Pearly said there were four of them, and there were four more. Then the hand of the mother of corruption began to give activity, she said kill. As the owner of the power sealed within the relics, mother flew into a rage. Benna told Pearly that she shouldn't have told Marnak that. To which Pearly replied that Marnak would find out anyway as soon as he switched sides. Marnak was only too glad that they had four more relics. Marnak began to speak. He asked who, after all, drove the residents of the city crazy. Pearly said it wasn't her because she couldn't do that. Benna stiffened and turned to Pearly asking why she kept answering all his questions. But Marnak immediately cut off her head from her shoulders. Pearly screamed. Then he cut off her head as well. Pearly just said they'd see each other again. But that didn't mean anything to Jean. He said he was giving Ben and Pearly a present for his mother. He absorbed Benna and his divinity increased to 3023. But Pearly wasn't absorbed. Because she was dead, Marnak had no idea what her ability was. After eliminating the culprit of the madness, it became so quiet here, Marnak said. Suddenly someone called out to Marnak, and it was his companions. They said that everyone just fell to the ground and asked if he did his best. Yes, he did it. His companion asked if his spear was of any use. Marnak said that he was completely taken aback by how effective it was. Marnak hoped he hadn't seen the corruption giant helping him. Then Marnak said that we need to hurry, something huge will awaken soon. What is he talking about? They asked him, but at the same time, they saw for themselves. It was a huge monster with many teeth and eyes at first glance, but if you looked closely, you could see that it was made up of people. They were horrified to see this. They asked if the thing was really made up of corpses. This is what Marnak meant when he spoke of awakening. This thing looked really nasty. Even after death, Rivercal gathered all the bodies around him and took on such a hideous form. This gift is perfect for Rivercal, who is no less vile than this creature. Then Marnak turned to Dakia. He said he knew she was feeling a little uneasy about getting blood on her hands. But he would comfort her as soon as they were done here, and right now she needed to pull herself together. She smiled and asked him how he was going to comfort her. Marnak said he would think about it later. First, to save as many residents as possible, they need to stall for time. It was important to stall for time, because they were going to get help soon. Marnak said they could be sure of that. Then one of them noticed something. He told the priest, which suggests that help is already here. All the converted people continued to run towards the giant monster. Dasha said, pointing at the cloaked man, that it looked like he was coming straight for them. It looks like it, Marnak said, and the man continued to approach. This masked man spoke to the heroes and asked if anyone had the skill to take this spear and drive it into the giant's heart. All the heroes wondered what kind of spear this mysterious man was talking about. Marnak picked up a spear and asked the masked man if he happened to have a sword. The man simply remained silent. Then he created a sword. It turned out that he could create more than just spears. Marnak asked if, for that matter, the masked man could make two more swords and a bow and arrow. He said nothing again, then pointed a finger at the sky and a small portal appeared above him. The person said to ask for everything at once. Two swords, a bow and arrows fell from the portal. All the heroes took the weapons that they like. 
Dasha, waving her sword, noted that the sword was very light. The weapons were really quite good. The weapon is so sharp that you can't even say that it is made of bones, and it also contains the divinity of the Trumpeter of Eternal Rest. Against a creature made up of corpses, this weapon must be extremely effective. The masked man said that he would slow down the giant's movement for a while. He said that during this time, the heroes should plunge their weapons as deep as possible into the giant's heart, and that if they can handle it, they can keep the guns. The masked man blew on the trumpet. All of a sudden, all the dead crawling on the monster started to turn into water. Dasha said that the trumpeter transforms the dead he brought with him. Marnak didn't understand what was happening. The monster was covered in water, clearly not liking the liquid. The trumpeter transforms the dead into liquid, then compacts them to block the giant's movements. Meanwhile, the heroes approached the giant. Marnak thought that the masked man was far worse than the followers of evil spirits. But the masked man said that he only manages the vessels for souls who have already experienced death. He said that the weapons will tell the heroes the location of the giant's heart. I gave them the command to go ahead. Marnak still has some questions, but there's no time for that. Let's go, Marnak shouted, and the heroes raced off to fight. The loss of precious time can be disastrous for the heroes. The giant barely moved. Dasha said he couldn't even move properly right now. Suddenly the dead ran after her. Several of the dead were on top of her. But in the blink of an eye, they were all hit by an archer standing behind them. Marnaka's comrade said that he and Carmen would cut up the lower part of the giant. All right, we'll leave it to you, Marnak said, and ran on. Then he turned to Sajida and asked if he could pierce the giant's heart on his own, and Sajida was confused. Marnak then said that he would distract the giant's head, and Sajida agreed. Marnak wished good luck to Sajida. Crowds of dead people were on the way to Marnak. But they weren't a problem, he dealt with them easily. Marnak had volunteered to distract the giant's head for a reason. According to my mother, she feels divinity in the center of his head. Besides, when Marnak glared at the giant's face, it looked like rivercles. Marnak decided that this time, he would definitely chop off his head. He swung and swung his sword. He hacked the monster's face, similar to rivercles, into pieces. It destroyed absolutely the entire face. And having done this, he said that he would chop his head into small pieces with his own hands. One of the comrades standing in front of the heart said that this must be the monster's heart. Then he plunged the spear into the heart. The giant immediately felt intense pain. Suddenly, the dead began to turn into a green liquid. Dasha didn't understand what was happening. The giant then began to turn into a green liquid itself, and Dasha was shocked. And now the giant finally turned into a green liquid. The trumpeter was there, too. And here we see Marnak standing in a pool of blood. He is holding a red sphere that was also covered in blood. He just smiled lightly and closed his eyes, looking down. He was thinking about how he had finally managed to get his revenge. The image of Sanctus smiling came back to him, and Marnak was very excited that he had been able to get his revenge. So Marnak finally achieved his goal and avenged Sanctus' death. Dasha called out to Marnak and asked him if he was okay. But he looked at Dasha in silence and asked the heroes where Sajida was. I'm here, Sajida said, and he said it wasn't a bad spear as he carried it. And here we see that the heroes gathered, suddenly a masked man appeared out of nowhere. He ordered me to follow him. He pointed a finger at Marnak and told him to go only to him, and Marnak wondered why it was only him. As he followed the masked man, he kept thinking about why the man wanted to talk to him alone. He supposed that perhaps the masked man had found out that Marnak had appropriated the relic, or else he realized I was a follower of the evil god, Marnak said, and put a hand to his chest. Suddenly the trumpeter stopped. Marnak was careful, so he grabbed his sword and was ready to fight. His mother also said to kill him. The trumpeter said he was coming. Marnak felt this presence, he closed his eyes and imagined it, he knew it from the example of his mother's aura. This aura was also overwhelming, an aura that couldn't belong to a mortal being. A part of God descended to this place. Suddenly, the trumpeter of death and peace appeared from behind the masked man, with many trumpets and as many arms sticking out of it. The trumpeter was silent for a moment, looking at Marnak, who was already tense. Then he pointed at it with his finger and said one word, capital, Marnak did not understand anything when suddenly the trumpeter's mask began to fall off and he fell to the ground on his knees. The trumpeter disappeared with just one word. Marnak had previously asked him if the trumpeter had anything he wanted to say to Marnak. The trumpeter thought about it, he said that he did not know and did not want to know. So that's it, said Marnak, and taking the trumpeter by the hand, he helped him to his feet and suggested that in that case he should return. As they walked, Marnak remembered something. He started with a request. He turned to the trumpeter and asked if he could help the heroes with the restoration of Eratico if it wasn't too much trouble. However, the trumpeter only said that helping the living is not on his list of duties. Before he could finish speaking, he suddenly felt something amiss. And we see how he was torn apart, and then again we see that the trumpeter is alive, he breathed out in horror. 
he turned to Marnak and asked what he could do to help them, and Marnak asked him to find the survivors. Are these all requests? The trumpeter asked, and Marnak also asked the trumpeter to help any survivors he found move to safer buildings. Then the trumpeter blew the trumpet. The dead men were sitting on the floor, but then they suddenly got up and began to obey. They went to look for safe houses. Then Marnak said that he would be very grateful if the trumpeter ordered the dead to move any valuables they could find to those very safe houses, otherwise they might just burn up in a fire. The trumpeter blew again, but he was tense because Marnak didn't say everything at once. Suddenly Marnak said there was something else. The trumpeter stiffened again, not liking it. Marnak asked the trumpeter to help put out the fire. The trumpeter was angry and asked me to say it all at once. And now we see how the heroes say goodbye to the trumpeter. Marnak said it was just his right hand, but he would like to leave it to the trumpeter. Then he gave it to the trumpeter. He just looked at the hand in silence. Then we see the trumpeter standing and the dead men obeying him. Marnak looked at it and thought that he had never expected to see the trumpeter of eternal rest helping him. He also noted that the trumpeter was very kind. Dasha went up to Marnak and asked him if he had asked the trumpeter for help. Marnak said it was him, but he didn't expect the trumpeter to agree. Suddenly Dasha gently took his hand and thanked him. She said that the trumpeter helped them a lot, my mother was jealous at that time. My mother kept repeating the same word, she said kill. She was very tense, holding her hands over the relic that Marnak had obtained after killing the giant. Marnak was sitting by the windowsill, thinking about what the trumpeter had to say to him. He assumed that the trumpeter was referring to the fact that Marnak could find another sacred relic in the capital. If this assumption is correct, then the trumpeter probably knows that Marnak is a priest of corruption. Suddenly he came back to reality and turned to his mother, and he began to talk about the god they had met today. He asked his mother if she knew him. Apparently, my mother didn't know, it was the first time she had met this god. Suddenly Marnak remembered what the trumpeter had said about not knowing and not wanting to know. It seemed that the trumpeter wasn't going to reveal Marnak's identity. But he wondered what was going on. Suddenly my mother went berserk and threw the relic. She cried because she couldn't break the connection between the relic and the divinity inside. Marnak told her not to worry, that he was confident that she would succeed. However, even if she is angry, do not throw objects. Then Marnak, hearing what his mother said, replied that he was glad that she wanted to help him. But if she tried not to throw objects, no matter how sad she was, she would immediately become three times more charming. And he lifted her up above him, and they both smiled, and she was glad. Then my mother asked if she would be three times as charming to Marnak. But Marnak, with the same smile as before, said no. My mother was shocked and confused, and she began to cry. Marnak asked her to listen to the end. He said that he was already captivated by his mother's immeasurable charm, so nothing would change. When my mother heard this, she stopped sobbing and listened to Marnak. Then we see Marnak hug her and tell her that nothing will change whether it's three or even a hundred times. Marnak then asked his mother if she promised not to throw things around even if she was sad. Judging by her response, she promised. And so we're transported to the bar. There goes a man who asks another man if he has ever heard that followers of evil spirits appear here and there. At this time, that blue-haired girl was sitting there and listening to their dialogue. It turned out that this wasn't just happening in their kingdom. The Dragon Kingdom in the East, the Desert Kingdom in the West, and the Northern and Southern Empires. She continued to listen to the two men talk, and one of them said that he remembered exactly what Kelton and Eridico had just heard. Another asked if their city was in danger, to which the other replied that both of these cities were not so far from their city. But then one of them said there was nothing to worry about. There is a certain man who destroyed all the followers of evil spirits in both cities. The other man remembered, too, and asked if he was talking about the guy who saved Eridico Marnak. The black-haired man said it was true, only thanks to Marnak could they sit here and drink in peace. So they pushed their mugs together and shouted Marnak's name. They continued to drink to Marnak and were happy. But the blue-haired girl had heard enough, she had heard about Eridico's savior, Marnak. The action shifts to a castle where someone curses the followers of evil spirits. It was a man. As he walked down the corridor, he told them that he had even managed to persuade Lord Eradico to help them capture the princess. But thanks to the degenerates, both the Lord and the assassins are dead. They're like annoying midges, he thought, closing his eyes. I'm sure the damned prince will be furious at what he's hearing, he said. But if this man doesn't do something, the prince will be even angrier at him. He knocked on the door. He turned to his highness and said it was Hilden. Meanwhile, the prince was lying on a sofa near the window. He clearly had a displeased look on his face. Then the action moves to another, snowy location. Marnak stood with his sword at the throat of the man sitting across from him, while corpses littered around them. Marnak asked him what the man had been talking about recently. Marnak was asking again if they really wanted them to give them everything they had. The man just sat with his hands clasped together and begged for mercy. Dasha, who was standing next to him, only wanted to tell Marnak not to kill, 
but there is no middle of the word, we see that the man's blood splattered to the sides from Marnak's blow. Dakia was uncomfortable and looked away and down. Marnak told her that he would bury them. And here we are, a cross made of sticks and a large mound of earth sticking out of the snow-white snow. Warnek turned to his mother. He had presented these gifts to her. He put his hands together and absorbed these people, his divinity rising to 3379. After devouring them, he said that they had gathered quite well thanks to the robbers. Let's go back, he said, and the heroes followed him. They were walking when suddenly Dasha spoke to him. He asked her what was the matter. Dasha was embarrassed. She said that she did not accuse him of anything, but asked him to understand her correctly. She said that they had never spared a single robber during all this time, and she asked Marnak what was the reason for this and if he could explain it to her. Marnak looked at her and she said that if he didn't want to, he didn't have to talk. Marnak chuckled slightly and asked her if she had asked Carmen and Sajida the same question. She said what she had asked, and Carmen replied that since the bandits dared to attack them, seeing that they were armed, it was obvious that they would not hesitate to attack the defenseless, which Carmen could not allow. Sajite said he was just doing a mercenary's job, and if that was Dash's wish, he would try to keep as many bandits alive as possible. Jin smilingly said that in his case, he believes that everyone has potential. She asked what potential Marnak was talking about. Then she asked him if he was convinced that these bandits could be reborn. Marnak said that, as she had suggested, he believed that these bandits and bandits would be able to atone for their sins and live a happy new life. Then Yudasha got even more confused and said that maybe then they should not have been killed. Marnak told the princess to understand that the first time is the most difficult in any case, then added that he thought they were more likely to return to the path of evil instead of thinking about redemption. That's why Marnak kills them. A lot of calculations took place in Dasha's head and she began to think seriously. But do we have the right to judge them? Asked Dasha. None of the gods gave a definite answer to this question. But at the same time, there is a mother. She allowed Marnak to do whatever he wanted. Marnak told Dasha that when he killed bandits, he wasn't trying to be a judge. He is only taking responsibility for the choices he has made. She asked about responsibility. Marnak went on to say that if he spared the scoundrel, he would then go back on a crooked path, ending the life of an innocent. Between being responsible for such an outcome and the fact that he would kill them, making it impossible for them to atone for their sins in this life, Marnak decided to choose the second option. Dasha understood everything Marnak was saying. He also said that he himself does not know when he will have to pay for all the murders that he committed. However, no matter how heavy the weight on his shoulders was, he made this choice himself. Marnak knew from his own experience that showing mercy to a villain who would then kill an innocent person was a very, very terrible experience. He was annoyed at the thought of Rivercole. He thought that if he didn't have the ability to make sure that the hero lived an exceptionally righteous life, then his potential didn't matter. Marnak had promised himself never to spare such people again after Sanctus was killed. Dasha realized something. She shyly asked if he could tell her what had happened. Suddenly she blushed and said again that if he didn't want to, he didn't need to. Marnak smiled and said that he would have no problem telling them, but he thought that this story could wait. When Dasha asked him why, he pointed with his finger and told her to take a look. The heroes saw a group of merchants in the distance. Sajida offered to say hello to them. Sajida suggested that the group is so big that they probably don't have any money constraints and that they might buy the equipment that the heroes borrowed from the bandits from them. Marnak agreed with this idea. We see that the heroes are already communicating with the merchant, who is a robot. The merchant looked at the sword of Marnak and admired it. She said that the metal is perfect. Truly, this alloy is the pinnacle of technological skill of the ancient empire. Marnak was a little confused. The merchant then apologized and said that he had never seen a sword with such a high immortalium content before, so he was somewhat taken aback. Carmen asked if the merchant meant by immortalium the metal that is also called eternal metal. The merchant said it was, and it wasn't just an immortalium. In this sword, it is twice as much as the merchant managed to collect in 120 years. The merchant said that this is an extremely rare item and expressed a desire to purchase it for any price. Marnak said he had no plans to sell it. The merchant was a little upset and said that if this sword was his, then of course he would also refuse. Carmen told the merchant that she believed he had invited them for a reason. The merchant remembered his original purpose. He said that he wanted to hire them as guards for the journey to the capital of the Northern Kingdom. He said that according to them, their way lay through Eratico. Which means, suddenly, the merchant started shouting nicknames such as the Demon Slayer of Guys, the sworn enemy of the evil spirits of Kelton, and the savior of Eratico. Marnak was confused. The merchant asked him if he was the same priest of Marnak and said that there was no doubt about his skills. He said that if the heroes agreed to this job, he promised to reward them adequately, 
he would offer them the best conditions of all the merchants. Carmen turned back to the merchant and asked if he could give them some time to discuss his offer. The merchant left the room and said that he would look forward to waiting for the consent of the heroes. And now we see how the heroes are located in tents in the middle of a snow-covered forest. Marnak gives a massage to his mother, who is sitting on a chair. He suggested to her that since they had accepted the job, let's find a decent inn to rest in when they got paid. Suddenly, there was a shout from outside. You can see that there are three knights and something is flying at them. One of the knights was confused, he signed up and barely shouted out that they were attacked. They were attacked by huge bats. Bats attacked the camp. Jin came to the defense, and with his sword, he killed one of the mice. Carmen wasn't idle either. He also killed mice with his arrows. Together, they mercilessly and quickly killed bats, then Dasha joined them, who wanted to use magic to save the person who was attacked by the mouse. But unexpectedly for Dasha, this mouse was killed by an arrow. She turned around and Marnak told her not to, because the magic of an ally who can't control his powers is more terrible than the enemy's spear. Dasha whined and said that she was not so bad. Dasha said that she would definitely hit such huge mice and that Marnak would have no doubts. Marnak, in turn, replied that they are certainly large, but they can fly. And this makes their movements much less predictable than those of opponents who walk on the ground. And that there is no guarantee that the spell she misses will not hit her ally, so he asks her to refrain from reading them. Dasha was offended and let off steam and complied with Marnak's request. After they had fought off the bats, Marnak went into one of the tents. His sword was covered in blood. It was a merchant's tent. He asked Marnak if he would like to sheathe those magnificent swords from the Immortalium. Marnak said it would depend on the merchant's response. The merchant said it looked like he should think twice before giving an answer. Marnak said that he had noticed it correctly, and Marnak gripped the sword in his hand and told the merchant to answer. Marnak asked why followers of evil spirits were attacking a merchant's trading caravan. The merchant asked if Marnak would believe him if he said he didn't know. Marnak slammed his sword down on the table. The merchant was startled and hurried to stop him. He said that because of Marnak's services to the kingdom, he was willing to trust him. With that, Marnak sheathed his sword. He said that he hoped that this time the merchant would not hide anything. The merchant asked Marnak if he would keep this conversation a secret. Of course Marnak said. He said that he was only here as a mercenary and he didn't want to talk about any secrets. And then the merchant ordered a subordinate to bring something. The merchant said that the followers of the evil spirit started attacking them after they were given one item and asked to deliver it to the capital. Marnak said they must have suffered a lot of casualties if the attacks had been going on for so long. He asked why they did not refuse this request. The merchant said that he had received Immortalium as an advance, and they also promised to give him more Immortalium as soon as the package was delivered. He confessed that he had no idea why the followers of evil spirits needed this item. He had already asked another priest, but he also said that he didn't know anything and the merchant showed what to deliver, it was something that looked like a necklace. Marnak immediately recognized what it was, and it turned out to be a sacred relic containing his mother's divinity. That's why the followers keep attacking the caravan. Marnak couldn't figure out how they could locate his mother's relics. The merchant asked Marnak what he thought about this and if he had any idea why they were hunting for this item. But Marnak lied and said he had no idea. He said that he was generally clear about the merchant's situation, and he said that there was something else they should discuss. The merchant immediately understood that we are talking about payment. Marnak said that since the merchant had withheld such information, it was only fair to increase their reward, and he suggested doubling it from the original amount. The merchant was shocked by this audacity, but he had no choice and agreed. The merchant then jokingly asked Marnak if he had ever considered quitting his job as a priest and becoming a merchant. And now we see how the tents are standing and everything is calm. Sajida said that the soldier's equipment looked noticeably shabby. He assumed that this was probably not the first ambush. Dasha said you could have told them right away. Sajida agreed with her opinion. He said that otherwise they were still going in the same direction as the merchant. And surely they would have been ambushed sooner or later, too, even if they hadn't accepted the merchant's offer. Carmen added that their priest also went to double their salary. Marnak said that he just demanded what they all deserved, and Dasha was just glad that everyone was safe. Carmen clapped and said it was time to go to bed, because they had a long way to go tomorrow. Everyone dispersed. My mother said she wanted Marnak to steal the relic right now, but he said it would be terrible if he was noticed. My mother said that if there were no witnesses, then the crime could be considered perfect. Marnak had said that she thought like an assassin, but there was no need to hurry now, at least until they found out what the merchant was capable of. He told his mother that she knew very well that metal didn't rot. Instead, Marnak wants to allow the followers of evil spirits to steal the relic, and when they return it, extract the divinity from it and return the empty shell. My mother was delighted with Marnak's ingenious plan. My mother asked him why he had been hiding his genius all this time. Marnak said she was praising him too much. Suddenly, someone shouted ambush. Marnak said he'd just cleaned up. 
He pulled out his sword and decided that he just needed to deal with them quickly. One of the people shouted that the monsters were attacking, while a large white monster with horns was running towards him. The monster continued to run somewhere, scattering all the soldiers in its path. This monster was running straight at Marnak. This is the Karpel monster. Marnak swung, and Karpel started running toward Marnak. They collided, but Karpel blocked Marnak's blow with his horns. Marnak was taken aback for a moment, but then decided that if the monster wanted to, then he would chop off the extra horns. Everything was covered in blood, and Marnak managed to get Karpel out of the way. Suddenly, he noticed something, a red light was coming from behind the bushes. Suddenly she came running at him, screaming. Marnak recognized her immediately. Marnak held her by the throat, but she smiled and said that they had not seen each other for a long time. Marnak held Pearly by the neck with one hand and lifted her up. She said that she really missed Marnak and asked if he missed her. He replied that he had never thought of her. She jokingly said that she would consider herself bored for two. Marnak told Pearly that he wanted to ask her something. Pearly laughed. She asked him how he would thank her if she answered his question. And now we see the following picture, Marnak killed someone. He cut down some monster. Then we see a monster that looks like an elk. It has huge horns and sharp, apparently, horns protrude from its back. Carmen shot the monster in the head. Marnak thanked Sajit for his help, to which he replied that no problem. Suddenly Carmen noticed something, and he shouted, pointing behind Sajita and Marnak, that someone was running away. It turned out to be the same monster that Carmen shot. Marnak ran after him and said that he would take care of this monster himself. Marnak tried to catch up with him, but he decided to do it differently. He threw the sword at the monster and it fell. Marnak walked over and retrieved his sword. Then Marnak moved on. We see that he came to the tree where Pearl was hanging. He said he couldn't have come earlier, it just so happened. Pearly was annoyed and talked about how long Marnak had been gone. Pearly jumped down from the tree and asked if Marnak was now ready to grant her wishes. He asked what that meant and then said that of course he wasn't ready. He told her to answer the questions first, and she agreed. Marnak asked her how many spirit followers were behind the ambushes on their caravan. Pearly fell into a stupor, she was not good with math and began to count on her fingers. Then she happily said that there were three of them, not counting her. But then, with a serious face, she added that they were all acting as if she wasn't there. She was angry with them, saying it was too rude of them. Marnak just smiled and thought. Pearly, at the first request, blurts out secret information to his enemy. If she had been Marnak's ally, he would have ignored her, too, that's what he concluded. Marnak played along with her and said that it was a horror and called them bad people. Pearly was so naive that she didn't even notice the hypocrisy. Then Marnak asked her if she knew why they were attacking the caravan. But Pearly immediately replied that it was because of the necklace. They need to get the necklace from the head of the trading group, Pearly said. Marnak asked what made them think the merchant had it. Pearly said she didn't know, but she knew that the person who asked the merchants to deliver the necklace was a member of Liberatio. Marnak asked about Liberatio. He told Pearly that Liberatio was a secret society of followers of evil spirits. He asked her if the followers of the evil spirits attacking the caravan were themselves part of this society. She said it was true. Pearly told Marnak that there was a split in society. She said that there was nothing serious about it, as she would say a small disagreement. Marnak asked her what caused the split. Pearly said she'd heard about it once, but she'd forgotten. Marnak was a little surprised that she didn't remember, even though she was on the side of one of the factions. Pearly smiled and said she was neutral. She simply does what is asked if she is given food or supplies in return. Marnak asked what materials she was talking about. Pearly replied that the materials were needed for her dolls. She cupped her hands and said that she was a priestess who worshipped the swinging string. At that moment, Marnak realized that what was standing in front of her now, like what he had seen last time, were just dolls, and that was why he couldn't absorb her then, because it was a doll. Suddenly Pearly remembered something, she said that Marnak should be on the lookout. The guys who came with her were planning something without her. Marnak suddenly thought of something, and then asked her why she was so friendly to him. She asked him if he was really so interested in the reason for her kindness. Suddenly, she gave a creepy smile and said that this question was different from the ones he asked earlier. Marnak said nothing, then turned around and said that he didn't even want to know after that. Pearly freaked out and started rolling on the floor, begging me to ask her again. But Marnak declined her request, because she could have just answered when he asked. Marnak abruptly changed the subject and asked her what she wanted from him in return. Pearly smiled and said she would tell him, but only when they met again. Is that so? asked Marnak. Then he said goodbye to her and cut off her head. Like last time, Pearly said they'd see each other again. After that, Marnak returned to the camp. On arrival, someone called out to him. It was the princess, and he asked her what was the matter and said that she should rest, because they still didn't know when the evil spirit followers would attack next. 
Dasha said that she would rest and that he would not worry. She added that she could not find him earlier and asked where he was. Marnak smiled and said that he chased deep into the forest after Carpel, where he sensed the presence of a follower of the evil spirit, so he decided to explore the area more thoroughly. Dasha asked in surprise if he had fought anyone there. Marnak said that he didn't fight, according to him, by the time he got to the place, no one was there. What a pity, said the princess, and she went up to Marnak, and suddenly she took out a handkerchief and held it up to Marnak's face to wipe it. Marnak was embarrassed, and told Dasha that her handkerchief would get dirty, while my mother was jealous again. Dasha said she brought this handkerchief especially for him. She took his hand and asked him to come closer. Seeing all this, my mother was furious. That's all, said the princess, and left the handkerchief to Marnak, who gave it to him. Then she went to bed, saying goodnight to Marnak before leaving. Marnak returned to the tent, saying that it had been a rough day. Suddenly, Granny jumped out of his pocket. She was holding the handkerchief that the princess had given her and said something. Marnak said he could wipe his own face and asked her not to bother, but she insisted. She was wiping Marnak's face and crying, but she was doing it too hard, so it hurt Marnak. And now we see how the caravan went on, and with them our heroes. Suddenly Marnak noticed something. Looking towards the forest, he wondered what that sound was. He remembered what Pearly had said about being on the lookout, and assumed it was an ambush. Then he realized that this was not so, something happened on the mountain and an avalanche began. Marnak shouted for everyone to drop their luggage and run immediately. The avalanche had already reached the route the heroes were on. And we see Dasha heading straight for the avalanche. That's how this video ends. If you have sat through to the end, please don't forget to press the subscribe button and leave feedback. See you in the next video.